and I want to welcome everyone to the regular meeting of the Larkspur City Council for Wednesday, May 19th, 2021, and we're starting just a minute or two after our scheduled time of, of 6.30. Um, as is our habit lately, this meeting will be conducted by video and teleconference only. Uh, the, inf the information to join the meeting um, um, by Zoom, as well as a call-in number are available on the agenda, which is posted on our city uh, website. So welcome everyone. And why don't we get started with a roll call on the pledge. Council member Candell. I am here. Council member Paulson. Here. Council member Way. Here. Vice Mayor Hilmer. Here. Mayor Haroff. And I'm here too. So with that, let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. And I see the flag is waving. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, invisible, with liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. Good enough. Thank you all. Uh, then we'll get into the regular uh, meeting agenda, which will start with item number two, which is public comment. Uh, this is an opportunity for members of the public to comment um, on matters that are not included on today's uh, agenda. Um, we are not able to respond to public comments uh, as a council, but we welcome anyone who would like to share their views on an item not on the agenda to take this opportunity to do so. Please keep your comments uh, limited to three minutes if possible. Is there anyone um, in the queue for public comment, Allison? Yes, our first comment will come from S. Soriano. Okay, and always please state your name and where you live when you before you start. Hello, good evening. My name is Sarah Soriano. Um, I am a resident of Novato, but I'm not speaking for myself tonight. I'm speaking for um, a high school student um, who goes to Redwood High School. Um, and she, would, she has asked me to say this statement to her because she is um, in a sport practice at the moment. Dear okay. Larkspur City Council members and Larkspur City staff, my name is Annika Don, and I am a sophomore at Redwood High School. I am reaching out to you today to ask that you please consider making a change to the smoke-free policy and multi-unit housing ordinance to protect every resident from secondhand smoke with no exemptions for medical cannabis smoke. Um, it is my understanding that this proposal is an item that is being postponed to be addressed later this year but I'm here to say that postponing this issue is putting the health of too many people at risk knowingly. Smoking and secondhand smoke is the cause of almost half a million deaths a year across our nation. We should not allow it in our multi-unit housing residences where people are forced to deal with its negative impact on not just their health, but of their babies, elderly family members, and other vulnerable populations. It is important for this policy to be comprehensive and not include any exemption of any kind of secondhand smoke, including that of medical cannabis or marijuana, because that smoke contains many of the same cancer-causing substances and toxic chemicals as secondhand tobacco smoke. The fine particulate matter of marijuana can deeply impact someone's health when it is breathed deeply into one's lungs. There are numerous ways that people can take medical marijuana without harming the health of others. Residents in our multi-unit housing should not have to worry about their safety and health while in their own homes. That is why I ask you to do your part and close the loophole to smoking in multi-unit housing. Should not have to worry about um, their safety and health while in their homes. That is why I ask you to do your part and close this loophole to smoking in multi-unit housing here in Larkspur so that families like mine do not have to worry about the air we breathe in. Please protect all of our residents in multi-unit housing by making our homes 100% smoke-free now. Thank you, Annika Don. Okay, thank you for uh, reading those comments from Annika. Um, 
comment will come from Jasmine Garati. OK, go ahead, Jasmine. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes, um, I'm here as well, speaking on behalf of a student who was unable to attend tonight on a similar topic because I know this was just addressed with Corte Madeira City Council. So I'm going to read a statement on behalf of Nady Mendoza. She says, hello, city council members and staff. My name is Nady Mendoza and I'm 17 years old and I have lived in multi-unit housing here in Marin County my whole life. I have learned that living in this kind of a residence means that I have to deal with the issue of people smoking around my home on a regular basis. More recently, I have noticed that the majority of time that I have noticeably inhaled secondhand smoke in my family's apartment comes from the smoke of both nicotine and cannabis. Sometimes I wanna open my windows so that I can get fresh air in my room in my family's apartment but I can't because of how bad and strong the, the smell of secondhand smoke from cannabis is. Lower income populations and communities of color have higher rates of exposure to secondhand smoke and higher rates of health issues. Lower income residents desire smoke-free housing, but there is less availability of smoke-free buildings and fewer options to move here in Marin County. Everyone, regardless of their financial situation, deserves to breathe safe, smoke-free air at home. Our homes should be our sanctuaries where we are able to have the right to access fresh air. Please prohibit smoking inside or close 30 feet, 30 feet of multi-unit housing here in Larkspur and please eliminate any exemptions to this rule. Thank you very much from Nady Mendoza. Okay, great. Thank you for those uh, those comments. Uh, anyone else in the queue, Allison? Our next comment will come from Sarah Taff. Okay, Sarah, are are you uh, uh, in Larkspur or some other community? Hi. Um, yes, I'm in Mill Valley. Okay, thank you. Dear Larkspur City Council members, my name is Sarah Taft. I grew up in Mill Valley, attended Tamil Pius High School and I'm currently studying public health at Tulane University. I'm an intern with the Marin Tobacco Control Program and would like to express my, con my concerns about secondhand smoke in multi-unit housing in Larkspur. Tobacco smoke contains more than 7,000 chemicals, 70 of which are known carcinogens. Sustained exposure to these products through secondhand smoke and alter can alter lung and heart function and impact childhood development. In multi-unit housing, the smoke produced within a single unit can travel through vents, windows, and under doors to be inhaled by other residents. Any one person smoking in a multi-unit housing complex is increasing the risk of smoking-related diseases for the entire group. With lower-income individuals making up the majority of multi-unit housing complexes, it is an equity issue to expose those residents to the harmful effects of secondhand smoke. Allowing multi smoking in multi-unit housing is a public health problem because it exposes residents to toxic chemicals, increasing negative health outcomes. No amount of secondhand smoke is safe for residents to inhale, which is why I am advocating for 100% smoke-free multi-unit housing with no exceptions. Larkspur is one of four remaining communities in Marin County, which has not yet adopted smoke-free policies for multi-unit housing. Research has shown the implementation of smoke-free legislation is strongly correlated with decreases in heart and lung disease. I'm asking that the Larkspur City Council put 100% smoke-free multi-unit housing on their agenda as soon as possible. Thank you for your time and consideration. Yeah, thank, thank you for those comments. Uh, anyone else in the queue? The next comment will come from Arminia Acosta. Okay, Arminia, welcome. Hello, my name is Arminia Acosta. I am a Marin County Resident, um, dear Larkspur City Council, good evening and thank you for your the time you allow me and the community to voice our opinion and concerns about how our community functions. My name is Nia Costa and I am a high school student here in Marin and I am a member of the Youth Advisory Council. We are a group of passionate students that are dedicated to helping our community by ensuring we do what we have what we can to help everyone stay 
safe and healthy from the dangers related to substance use. During the past year, I have learned about the harms and policies regarding secondhand smoke in multi-unit housing here in Marin. I've, I've also had to spend too much time inside my home, a multi-unit residence this past year due to the pandemic, which we all have to do. Thinking about the fact that hundreds and thousands of residents that live in multi-unit housings like me had to inhale secondhand smoke of their neighbors saddens me to think that several cities or to be exact, including the city of Larkspur allows it. Makes me mad, please act now, not later this summer or later this year and avoid the further development of illness, diseases and death from secondhand smoke. Thank you. Okay, thank you for those, those comments. Uh, anyone else waiting to speak? I'm looking for any further raised hands from our audience members or any emailed public comments and there is no further public comment. Okay, good. Well, with that, of course, the, the, the smoking ordinance is not on tonight's agenda, and um, um, I, I do expect we'll be addressing that at some point here in the future, and maybe ask the city manager if he has any expectations about when it might be put on our agenda. Um, I believe it was sometime last week I informed the Smoke Free Marin folks that I expected this item to be coming later this summer or in the early fall. That was based on my assessment of your current calendar and policy issues, the availability of staff to work on the issue, and also um, the fact that there's a lot of noticing that needs to go into this. One thing I think a few of the speakers said incorrectly is Larkspur does have a smoke free policy for multi unit. Uh, dwellings, but does have some exemptions. Smoke Free Marin has asked us to remove those exemptions. Uh, some members of the council were part of the council when those exemptions were placed in, and we'll recall that our community had a fairly uh, significant discussion and debate about those policies, and uh, we need to notify everyone who was involved so they have an opportunity to participate in this discussion. Um, so that was why we told them it would come later in the summer or early fall. Um, if the council wants it moved up uh, to come earlier in the summer, I'll need that direction at some point because I'll need to shift other pressing policy issues back farther to accommodate that. Okay. Well, I think that's something for us to, to consider. I don't think we need any action on that uh, this evening. Um, so I think with that, we'll close the, um, the public comment uh, uh, item on the agenda, and we will move to item number three, presentations or proclamations, which, of which there are apparently none. And I will then have us move to uh, item number four, which is approval of consent calendar. And we'll start by asking first if there is anyone on the council that would like to remove any item on the consent calendar currently for separate consideration. Seeing none, um, Allison, uh, let's uh, look to see if there's any from, have any member of the public who would like to request a removal of one of the items, one or more of the items for separate consideration. Looking for any raised hands from our audience members or any emailed comments. And there is no public comment. Okay. Well, with that, then I'm going to look for a motion to approve the consent calendar. I'll move the consent calendar. I have a second. I'll second. Okay. Uh, do we need a roll call? Council Member Candell? Yes. Council Member Paulson? Yes. Council Member Way? Yes. Vice Mayor Hilmer? Yes. Mayor Hara. Yes. So I think the motion is approved. Uh, and we'll move on to the city manager's uh, oral report. We'll give it to Dan Schwartz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council members. I just have a few items to update you on. Uh, one is a reminder for the council and the public that we have a special meeting of the council on Monday. Uh, the purpose of that special meeting is to go over um, the proposed ADA improvements and other 
uh, potential streetscape improvements for the downtown corridor, the Magnolia corridor. Um, additionally, we'll be talking with the council about the parklets that were approved on a temporary basis during uh, the current pandemic and whether the council and the community are interested in a long-term um, parklet policy and having parklets become a permanent part of the landscape and whether there ought to be design criteria around those parklets. Uh, that special meeting is scheduled uh, for a, a Zoom teleconference on Monday, May 24 at 7 p.m. And we hope the public will come out and participate and engage the council in a healthy discussion. Good. The other thing I uh, just wanted to remind folks, uh, you're hearing this a lot from a lot of corners, but really encourage you to visit the Marin Municipal Water District website and read up on ways you can save water. Uh, conservation is gonna be the key to carry us through uh, the projected drought and uh, everybody will need to do their part. So right now, as the council heard at its last meeting, the measures are, that are in place are voluntary. Um, and so it's best to go educate yourself by visiting the water district's website. Uh, then lastly, uh, we are in the process right now of recruiting members for the library board, uh, a, a vacancy on the library board. There's also a vacancy on the measure B oversight committee um, and really encourage folks to uh, visit our website look into those uh, opportunities and we hope we'll get some more applicants. With that, Mr. Mayor, I turn it back to you. Okay, great, thanks for that report. And just a, a quick footnote on the report on what the Water District is doing on water conservation. Um, I, I wanna um, um, reiterate the suggestion for everybody to go and take a look at the website and the information that's available. Um, there's basic information about where we are in terms of water supply within the county. There are new developments on that pretty much uh, every day um, in terms of access to water resources. Um, the, 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 the restrictions on water usage through irrigation and suggestions for managing water both inside your house and outside your home um, are there. And one thing that's also there is um, uh, the opportunity to call the water district up to request free water saving devices, including nozzles for your garden hoses, uh, aerators for your kitchen and, and bathroom, um, and um, those nice little blue signs that you may be seeing popping up around uh, in the area. They'll make those available uh, to you for free. I've got a couple of them out in my front yard now and picked up um, aerators and no nozzles for hoses and all kinds of things. And they're very, they're very helpful in providing that. So that's a resource for everybody. It's, it's free. You can either pick them up there if you make a, uh, an, an appointment to do that. Um, and they'll be very helpful in providing you with it, what you're asking for. So I encourage everybody to do that. Um, any other comments from the council on the city manager's oral report or questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to council members' oral reports and comments. And I'll ask if any member of the city council has a report they'd like to make this evening. I see Vice Mayor Dan Helmer's got his hand up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would just like to give due respect and acknowledge the comments made by the high school students during public comment tonight. Um, I think that uh, the pandemic and the year, the challenges that the year has posed for uh, students of, of all ages. Uh, we may not have full uh, grasp, and I just want to take uh, the moment to acknowledge those comments and tell the students that I hear them as these comments are very serious, and I hear their uh, descriptions of an increased exposure, uh, whether it's during the day when they might be expected to be uh, home remote learning. And I just uh, can't, I would, I'd like to learn more about this. And if there's anything we can do to um, expedite the uh, council discussion of this, I don't expect the city staff to do anything uh, unreasonable, but I would like to have that accelerate. Thank you. 
Okay. Yeah, I think I think we'd all like to see that uh, teed up as soon as it's uh, practicable, given other commitments by its staff and and other resources that we have um, already in the hopper. But we'll we'll get to it. Um, any other comments from the council or reports? Sorry. Yes, I see Council Member Way. Uh, since we last met, um, there has been uh, the Central Marin uh, Police Authority Council meeting that I attended. And thank you, Council Member Paulson, for being there. And there was also the Central Marin uh, Fire Authority um, quarterly meeting. So essentially, both of them um, were meetings in which we approved, reviewed, and approved the budget for both of those agencies. And there were also some staff um, changes with salary structures, pretty much what we usually do at this time of the year. Um, there was also with the Central Marin Fire a discussion of um, a opportunity to study the utilization of our fire uh, stations, and that's an underway now. So um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Councilmember Paulson for being there as an alternate and look forward to that. Uh, lastly, I many of you know I'm on the board of the Fire Safe Marin, and there is a uh, community wildfire protection workshop for Central Marin on June 2nd, and it's on Zoom. So you can go on to the Fire Safe Marin website and get all the information. And um, many of those are present presentations by our own Todd Lando, who is our Central Marin Fire. Um, uh, blanking on what his title is now, uh, prevention specialist. So um, that's my report. Okay, any, anyone else from the council want to make a report? Let's see, I gotta get back to my screen here, hold on. Um, uh, hey, Kevin, Dan, Dan Hill. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead, uh, Council Member Paulson. There, there's your hand. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, four uh, brief items. Uh, the League of Cities had their legislative uh, week last week, and I just wanted to bring to the Council's attention and also to the public's attention, you know, four of the bills that are really um, on the table. And one of them is uh, Senate Bill Number 9, which, you know, briefly would, would allow for possible multifamily and single family zoning. So the league has taken a strong opposed position to that and it'll move to the assembly where we'll try to work with uh, assembly member Levine in our district who you know, may actually put in some bill modifications because it's likely to go through, but uh, that's what I'm really tracking. And then Senate bill two is uh, involving the police authorities and taking away some of their immunity. And we've also put in an opposed to that for various reasons. Uh, and then there's a broadband build assembly bill 14, where they're looking for modifications. So there's quite a lot of legislation coming in the next few months. And on top of that, you know, there's quite a windfall to the state. Uh, and, and the you know, league is asking for $10 billion uh, to be distributed to, to the uh, cities, including homelessness and broadband and direct funding. So uh, anymore, I'll, I'll, I'll keep you updated. But anybody who's interested, please go to the league's uh, website. They have a lot of information. You can make your calls, you know, do your advocacy. I think at least two or three of these bills could really affect Larkspur. Um, second item is, is the uh, MCCMC Homelessness Committee, which is, um, you know, something that the mayor attends and asked me to be as an alternate. Briefly, there's um, some American Rescue Plan funding and there's a, a time uh, sensitivity to, to getting this funding. So I think that um, the Homelessness Committee will try to reach out to Larkspur and see if we can be participants in some matching grants. Essentially, they're trying to build 500 units for the chronically homeless in Marin. And, um, and you know, there's, there's a need for caseworkers and certain matching funds and so forth. So we, we may have this on a future agenda. Um, I'll, I'll probably be talking to the city manager and, and to the mayor just to understand what the next steps are for us. Um, and uh, just to tee off on the MMWD, I, I went ahead and got some yard signs. I really recommend anybody who's interested, just you know, shoot the uh, um, Marin Municipal you know, Water District Conserve site an yeah, email and they'll put signs out for you right there um, on, on the, uh, next to the, the Tamp Ridge Apartments. They're easy to pick up. I put them in my yard and you know, it's a great way to spread the word. Uh, and then lastly, I'm, I'm still trying to work with the mobile home park community. 
we had a meeting. I, I'll probably email them after this meeting. We haven't agreed on, on the next meeting, although we said roughly monthly. So I'll keep you posted if anything comes up there. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, th thanks for that. And thanks also for stepping in um, when I was uh, unavailable to attend the uh, MCCMC Homelessness Committee meeting um, last week. I, I appreciate that. Uh, any other council member reports? I'll just very briefly mention one um, uh, on, the, on the theme of, of homelessness. Um, for the last, I think, two years, I've been a member of the, uh, the, the countywide Homeless Policy Steering Committee which consists of uh, representatives from the county, um, uh, two jurisdictions that are members of the MCCMC, um, as well as various other stakeholders from around the county representing different interests and in, in county staff. This is a quarterly meeting of that group and it's mostly just to give an update on funding app or opportunities that are being pursued um, by the county um, statistics and, and other information that can be shared. Um, I'll be rotating off of that committee um, uh, next week, I think, and we'll probably have uh, another jurisdiction within um, uh, uh, a member of the MCCMC will take up that responsibility, but will still play a very important role in helping the work of that committee as well as other efforts that Gabe described. Um, secondly, um, attended our monthly meeting of the Larkspur Chamber of Commerce. Um, happy to report that we're still in the black in terms of our finances, although it, uh, it's it's going away quick. Um, so it's been a it's been a challenging year, and I think it's been a real accomplishment um, um, to the chamber to still remain viable and relevant to our community in this COVID year when it's been very difficult to get a lot of things done and a lot of fundraising efforts that typically would have in the past involved the wine stroll and other kind of public events that we just couldn't do um, last year. But some of those events are coming back. Um, I think we're tentatively planning to restart the wine stroll, which I know a lot of folks in the community like. We don't have a date for that, but hopefully it will be sometime in late September or October um, and uh, some other activities uh, as well. Um, right now, the chamber is making do with growing membership. Um, we have both uh, small businesses as well as some uh, some large ones that we're working on and hope, hope to have in the door, uh, including uh, Marin Health. We're going to try to pin them down. Um, so it's been a tough, tough year for the chamber, um, but we're still chugging along and uh, look forward to a better year uh, coming forward. And that's it for um, my report. And with that, I will go back and find my agenda. Which I've lost now, hold on, there it is. So I think that brings us to item number seven on the agenda, which is public hearings. And apparently we do not have any of those this evening. So we'll move right to agenda item number eight. And we have uh, several items on that one. And we'll start with item 8.1, operations and interagency coordination agreement for a three-year pilot bike share program. Um, with that introduction, could we have a staff report? Yes, good evening. Uh, Julian Skinner, I'm the Public Works Director for the City of Larkspur. Um, and we do have an agenda item for you tonight to authorize the City Manager to sign a coordination agreement for the Marin Sonoma Bike Share uh, Program. Um, so I have a, a PowerPoint presentation that'll uh, give a little bit of information about what the Bike Share Program is, uh, and then give an overview of the coordination agreement that we're asking you to approve tonight. Um, and then joining me um, tonight is Scott McDonald with the Transportation Authority of Marin. Um, he'll be with us to um, answer any questions that come up. If anybody uh, wants any additional details um, about the program or the um, or the agreement. Okay, um, we'll start out with a presentation. Uh, this is the Marin Sonoma Bike Share uh, Program. 
A um, little bit of uh, background. This is a pilot program um, at the moment. It's funded through an MTC grant uh, that uh, uh, Transportation Authority of Marin and their Sonoma counterpart received. Um, and it's primarily focused around um, the SMART corridor um, throughout Sonoma and Marin. Um, and so um, it's um, including the seven uh, jurisdictions along that corridor. Um, so we're looking to work together uh, in this bike share program. And um, that's what's uh, the essence of the coordination um, agreement that'll be uh, presented later. Um, so the program goals are basically uh, to support that last mile uh, component of transportation, people using the smart corridor, using a train, um, and obviously not going to stay at the smart station all day. They have a, a destination. So this is looking to get them from a smart station or another transit hub uh, to where their uh, trip uh, is intended for that day. Um, and so obviously this, uh, this goes towards reducing vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we're looking at uh, giving those riders an opportunity to use a bike uh, to get the last mile uh, so that it will incentivize them to use transit uh, for their trip uh, rather than uh, going in a car um, if the transit station doesn't have to be in close proximity to uh, where they're ultimately trying to get to. Um, and so some things that uh, Larkspur has done in the past, we have a bicycle and pedestrian master plan and also we're working on a climate action plan, um, a bike share program uh, is consistent with the policies that are included in these two documents. Um, and so the program itself, um, TAM um, and their Sonoma County part of, uh, counterpart went out with an RFP for providers. Uh, for the service and they ultimately um, entered into an agreement with Bolt Mobility um, and the details of the program are that Bolt would provide 300 um, e-bikes. So these are class one electric bikes where it's basically pedal assist. Um, you pedal and then the electric motor um, helps that uh, pedaling so you don't have to put as much um, effort into uh, making the bike go where you want it to go. As I mentioned, it's a three-year pilot program. Um, there is no cost to the agencies. Um, the, it's being funded primarily um, through the MTC grant, and then also there will be uh, rider fees. Um, they're looking at a station-based system, um, which means um, that there will be modular bike racks or virtual bike racks. Uh, but the smarts, uh, the bikes themselves have the technology uh, to be tracked. Um, with, um, and then there's a, a, a phone app and clipper card uh, so that somebody can unlock um, a bike. So the bikes, uh, the user would interact with the bike themselves rather than physically unlocking it from say a hard uh, bike rack. Um, and um, Bold is, is working on a pricing plan for users. Um, and um, as I mentioned, they're looking at being able to integrate the clipper card um, into that and then an app um, and then people will be able to pay per trip or pay for monthly memberships, um, things like that to use um, the bikes. Um, so the network overview, as I mentioned, is primarily centered around the smart corridor, um, but then there will um, also be opportunity to have other hubs in other locations. So um, there has been some public outreach. There's been some surveys uh, uh, gathering information from the public on where are they likely to go with these bikes and looking at places where we could have uh, other hubs located um, throughout the cities and, and towns um, along the SMART uh, corridor. Um, so they did receive over uh, 500 responses and feedback from the public on where they would be likely to uh, take these bikes from the SMART stations. Um, so what the coordination agreement basically does, as I mentioned, there's a few uh, uh, players in this. There's Bolt, um, who is the operator. Um, and then there are the two uh, congestion management agencies, the uh, TAM and then the Sonoma County Transportation Authority um, that will be basically uh, working with uh, Bolt to operate the system. And then um, each one of the partnering agencies, so each city that ends up with a bike rack um, or a hub in the city is also uh, known as um, a partnering agency in this. And so what the coordination agreement will do is define all of the roles um, as far as who's responsible for what. Um, and um, the, 
Um, as you can imagine, it took a while to get here. There's um, seven partnering agencies and the two CMAs and the owner. So it's been reviewed by all of the uh, legal counsels for each of the um, agencies. Um, and so the next step after the coordination um, agreement is starting to look at where these hubs would be. Um, so Bolt uh, will be working with each of the cities, um, working with the survey information that they received uh, to determine where um, the best place is to deploy uh, these bikes and where the best place is to have the hubs so people can, can leave them and then um, pick them up. Uh, one, um, one note for what's in the uh, coordination agreement is there um, um, is an agreement by all the participating agencies that because we're a participant in the bike and the bike share program that we will waive the fees uh, for these encroachment permits. So Bolt will be able to come in and put their uh, stations for dropping off and picking up bikes. Uh, we will give them an encroachment permit, but we will not charge them a fee uh, for that permit. So that waiver is um, contained in the coordination uh, agreement. Um, the CEQA is being done by each of the individual um, agencies. This is uh, going to be exempt as it uh, falls under the existing facilities and minor alterations to land. Um, and also we think the infrastructure for the bike um, parking uh, racks will be pretty minimal um, and um, that anything that is put in place in the coordination agreement um, allows us to change our mind or pick a better location. Um, and uh, the bike racks will be such that they can be removed without uh, leaving anything behind um, in the public right of way. Um, so as I mentioned, once the coordination agreement has been signed off by everybody, then we'll be moving to the next steps, which is putting this uh, system um, into place, uh, some more outreach and defining uh, where the hubs should be, where these bikes should be um, located. Um, and then uh, Bolt will be ramping up um, in, in addition to um, putting out the bikes um, in these locations and, and having the racks. Um, there's also the act of, of balancing. Uh, bikes don't always end up in places where people, uh, the next person may want to pick them up. Um, so there is uh, the maintenance operation of uh, what they call balancing, which is moving uh, bikes around at the end of the day. So they're where people need them in the morning um, and things like that. And then um, us along with the other cities and the uh, and TAM and SCTA will be working with Bolt to push out messaging and let the public know that, um, that this bike share uh, program um, is available. Um, so the request tonight is uh, that you authorize the city manager to sign this coordination um, agreement so we can move on to the next steps. As, as I mentioned before, the uh, finalizing where the hubs go and where the stations are is going to be at the city's discretion. We'll be issuing uh, encroachment permits for each of those um, individual um, locations. So that's an overview of, of the program and um, what's in the coordination agreement. So I'm available for um, any questions? And as I mentioned, Scott McDonald from TAM is here if you have any further questions about how the program uh, works. Okay, great. And, and thanks, Scott, for being uh, here with us tonight. Is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, absolutely. Thanks for uh, the opportunity. Uh, I think Julian did a good job giving you an overview, but I'm happy to answer any questions or um, your comments you have. Thanks so much. Okay, great. Any comments or questions from the council? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in the dark here. I don't know if you'd see me, but. Uh... <laughs> yeah, uh, Council Member uh, Kandel, Thanks. <laughs> your hands up. There you go. I, I apologize that the sun is coming through my back window and I, I don't know if you could see me. Um, the question I have is, um, so, so we have a couple of these stations, these bike racks, whatever we, we call them. Um, somebody takes the, the, the smart train in, uh, they hop on a, on a bike, they want to go to work. Um, do they take this bike and just like leave it outside their work or put it inside their work? Or does it have to, is it like a short term, you rent it for an hour from one station to another station? And if that's the case, how many of these stations are we talking about in, in Lawrenceburg so they can be strategically located uh, where people need to go from the train? Um, Julian, you want me to take that? Um, so basically they'd be highly to leave them at one of the hubs that are designated for the system, um, to, you know, generally for shorter trips. And then the bikes would then be made available for other people 
to use them if, if needed. So uh, they would be um, highly encouraged um, and their fees assessed if they leave them outside the service area or outside of a hub. Um, but people would, uh, so we'd expect to pick them up at one hub location and drop them off at another, uh, then making it available. So that hub might be very close to where they work, but they wouldn't actually bring them into their place of work. They would actually uh, dock the bike, uh, if you will, at the at the, one of the hubs. And I'm sorry, how, how many hubs are we talking about for the city of Larkspur? That's, that's yet to be determined. Um, you, usually there's about a 1.3 to 1.5 um, rack per bike ratio. So as Julian mentioned, there's, they get rebalanced. So the operators actually go out in the field to maintain service the bikes and actually rebalance them when needed, actually um, swap the batteries out as well because they are electric bikes. So when the batteries get low enough. Um, so we're still looking at the survey data, some of the demand uh, factors such as the survey input uh, population densities, as well as from the operational side, um, an approach to trying to keep the uh, somewhat of a concentrated network so that uh, it's manageable. But um, uh, we haven't uh, quite determined. Uh, probably over the next coming weeks, uh, potentially month or so, we'll get a better sense of what's the initial proposal in terms of how many hubs, how many uh, how many bikes potentially within the city of Larkspur city limits. Hey, thank you. Just just to follow up on 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 that, this is this is Kevin. Um, I understand this is a work in progress and you still have some work to do in order to resolve some of these issues about hub locations and how many there will be. Um, but uh, just to give a sense, I'm sure you have some criteria or priorities that have been set to guide you in making those decisions, like so many hubs within a certain radius of a smart station or something, something of that sort. Could you maybe give us an idea about what those criteria might be? Well, so initially with the uh, Bolt, the operator is going to be proposing basically a preliminary network for, uh, we have a working group we've been working on with, uh, working with the city staff and other jurisdictions. Uh, so they're like zones of interest where they're basically a two to three block radius um, of proposed locations. And then the city staff will consider right away uh, space constraints and actually narrow down precisely where the sites would be, um, what intersections, uh, whether it's on street or on sidewalks. So that will be determined later. So it could be somewhat iterative, but uh, the contractor's looking at uh, probably the next few weeks coming up with some type of proposal in terms of just general locations. And then from there, we'll be able to fine tune. Uh, you know, as, as uh, Julian mentioned, we'll have opportunity to uh, make revisions based on what, the, what locations make sense for the, for the city uh, within the overall network. And, and we'll have an opportunity to see what those plans look like as they get finalized before the ink is dry. I'm gonna to defer to Julian about how, how exactly that process would. Yeah, so we can certainly come back and, and give an update as we uh, work with Bolt and look at the information and, and, mm -hmm. and see where these, uh, where these hubs will be planned. We've certainly, from the public feedback, that we've received and I think anybody could probably imagine that you've got um, shopping centers, we've got a college, we've got a hospital um, and some other shopping areas and a downtown um, that when we do the survey, they show up as hotspots. Now, you know, there's there's seven cities up and down the corridor and there's 300 bikes. So, um, you know, we're not probably gonna be able to service every uh, requested location that came through on the survey, but uh, the bikes are, are, are smart bikes in, the, in that they're going to track information. And so what the operator will do is it's in their best interest to make sure the bikes are, are getting used because it generates revenue for them. So um, in an initial deployment of where these hubs go and how the bikes are distributed and used, they will be looking at that data and they will constantly be looking to see where the bikes are used and where they're not and looking for opportunities to um, increase the size of hubs um, or looking to add hubs if they have hubs that are um, underperforming. So um, we can certainly come back with an update to council as this thing gets closer to rollout and, and share um, where the public asked for um, the hubs and where we were able to deliver them. Um, and then um, keep updates on um, if there's any changes to those with the program moving forward. Yeah, I, th I think that would be helpful. And I think it would be helpful for, for Bolt and everyone else involved to get the feedback that we can provide through the, the council on whether what's being done makes sense 
from the community's uh, point of view, because I, mean, I think we all have a common interest in seeing the program be successful. And I think having um, um, vigorous public input into how it's getting laid out would be uh, useful to everyone. Anyone else from the council? I see Kath Catherine Way, your hands up. Yes. Hi, thank you for that presentation. Um, Scott, I, I know it's a pilot program, but are mm -hmm. there opportunities maybe uh, being considered for private property owners to have a hub on their land? For instance, the Bonaire Shopping Center has a Tesla charging station. Um, yeah, absolutely. We um, so the way the program structured, we have a three we have a grant for three hundred bikes to start. Uh, there's a there's an option to bring in additional fifty bikes, and basically the uh, those bikes will be split between Marin and Sonoma evenly. So we'll have about 150 bikes in Marin County to start. Uh, we're, I'll just say we've been certainly looking at Bonner Shopping Center as a, as a location, whether, you know, I, uh, it might be simpler to locate bikes on, on public right away to start. To start. Mm -hmm. uh, the contractor that we're working with certainly has experience doing kind of one-off uh, agreements with private property, major property owners. So um, that could definitely be an option as well. So uh, uh, if we actually just decided we would like to locate uh, some of the hubs on private property, it's, it's definitely an option for us. Yes. Two, uh, just two more things. Um, when you use an Uber bike, you can reserve them in advance mm -hmm. and get an advanced, uh, it locks that bike for, yeah. for that individual. Are, are Bolt uh, bikes able to be reserved in advance? So basically, yeah, you would look at the app. To, you could most people will use the app to identify where the bikes are currently available. Um, they would uh, basically, um, and so they would they would basically uh, unlock a bike from their app, so they could find out where the bike's available. They could reserve that bike. Um, I'm not exactly sure how far in advance. That's uh, something we're talking about with the. But um, once they determine that a bike's available through the through the app, um, they could initiate a trip through the app. Um, whether that's uh, how far in advance, I'm not exactly sure, but I, I believe that's something we could work out. Does it, do they also have the potential to disable a bike if it exits the, uh, the, the perimeter of uh, use that's been identified? For instance, if somebody picks up one at, Lurks, at the ferry terminal and rides across the Richmond San Rafael Bridge, and that's out of the jurisdictional area, are they disableable? Yeah, they are, and um, and it's something we asked about because we were asking about theft and you know the potential for theft or vandalism, and they haven't seen much of an issue because they are like as Julian mentioned, they are, you can track the bikes, um, and they can actually, as you mentioned, disable the bikes. Thanks. That's all. Okay, and I think uh, Council Member Paulson has his hand up. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, thanks, Julian and Scott. Uh, just to, I mean, first, I wanted to say since the ribbon cutting in 2019 at the Larkspur station, I've really been looking for a last mile solution. And, you know, I thought maybe the car companies would come in. So I'm really happy to see you guys doing this. And thank you for that. Um, I, I, I know that you don't know the data, you know, until you get deeper into the pilot, but just to get some, you know, orders of magnitude, 300 bikes is for roughly 10 stations, you know, and Larkspur is a terminal. But can we assume that we would have somewhere between 30 to 50 bikes at the most, you know, buzzing around the city at any given time? You know, so, it's, you know, we're looking at roughly 200 racks um, for the 150 bikes out of the 300 total that will probably start in Marin County. Uh, so between really the cities are, are Larkspur, San Rafael, and Novato. Uh, we're discussing now whether, it, you know, we can serve all six smart stations, but uh, there's certainly a lot of demand in Larkspur. So we've we've uh, learned from the survey in particular. Uh, on the demand side, they're also looking at other information from the city, population densities, as well as smart ridership uh, data. But um, uh, so it's really based on it's kind of an objective uh, technical analysis. Um, that's not far. I don't I don't think that's far off. But uh, we haven't determined the exact number of bikes to start nor the number of racks, probably the next month or two, we will have better sense of kind of initial uh, network proposal uh, possibly. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, the reason I'm asking, I, I appreciate that, you know, there's a lot of unknowns and, and you know, it's better to actually, but, um, you know, I would say if, you know, there were a hundred bikes, then I would worry with a CEQA exemption about circulation and about, you know, issues <clears throat> and, my, my next question really is, is, you know, rather than us voting on the resolution now, is there any problem with this analysis being done? Mm -hmm. And 
more information, bringing it back to the council. Because in principle, I'm very supportive, but I would just see, you know, I assume it's going to be the shopping centers and the hospitals, like Julian said, but, you know, just to get a sense of where the hubs would be and, you know, and the traffic times and how this might affect, I think the public would take a lot of interest in this. Right now, I think we're asking to sign something where we don't really know the impact on, on traffic or other, you know, type of environmental things. That was a question. I, I guess I'll repeat the question. I can defer to Julian. I, I will tell you, um, the city of Novato um, and city of Santa Fe have approved the participation in the program. I mean, really the coordination agreement, as Julian mentioned, is really the essence of it is really to define really the, um, the members of the program, you know, to work together as far as the siting and some of those specific details, I think, as Julian mentioned, you know, you'll have opportunity to discuss further. But I'll defer to Julian to answer some of the other questions you had. Yeah, I mean, so the the coordination uh, agreement is is more of a it lays out the responsibilities for each of the parties as far as um, what 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 the organizers, what the operator. Um, on what the participant agencies um, will be allowed to do and can be expected to do under this program. I think the, the, the details about how many bikes and where the bikes um, will be is, is gonna come somewhat later. And um, per the coordination agreement, the, you know, the city um, has the, the veto, I guess you would call it, on, on where these hubs go as far as if we don't, um, we don't approve of a certain location that it, it doesn't end up there. Um, you know, what we don't, um, what the city won't be able to say is, well, we want 60 bikes or whatever, but I don't know that we would be in a, you know, a, a position to, to, to do that until we see how the program um, rolls out. So, I mean, um, Scott, I'm not sure where um, in your process with, with Bolt that the, the check box is that this coordination agreement needs to be signed off on, but um, you know, it's um, it, it's basically just outlining the roles and res responsibilities. It's not really um, talking about um, exactly how it's going to get uh, deployed and and all of the details that will come later. That it it sounds like it's something that. Uh, we've heard from more than one council member that they're interested in in the next steps and we can certainly come back and, and provide um, updates um, and then as a as a you know a member of, of of the team working on this we can provide our input to bolt and, and to tam um, if we have desires for more bikes or, or or more racks or less bikes or less racks and and, and both the Novato and San Ravel have already signed off on this agreement that's correct. Right. Okay. Um, any, anything else? Uh, Council or Vice Mayor Dan Hilmer? Uh, you thank know? you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would just want to uh, say I'll be uh, supporting this this evening. I think it's particularly important given that SMART will be restoring weekday service as early as Monday and restoring weekend service as early as Memorial Day. So there's going to be an incredible demand for. Uh, us moving forward with coordinating last mile solutions such as this. And I believe that we can manage the details, but it's important to uh, get the process rolling uh, consistent with other jurisdictions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, great, thanks. Anyone else from the council? Um, seeing nothing, maybe we can uh, ask if there's anyone from the public who would like to uh, provide some feedback on this item. Our first comment will come from Kevin Carroll. Okay, Kevin, go ahead. Good evening, uh, Kevin uh, Carroll from Green Bay. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking, even though I'm a cab company owner, I really like this, this project. It's a great idea for the last mile solution. I do use public transportation myself, as does my son. Uh, it just happens uh, this weekend, he had on a, a flat tire on his medical knee scooter uh, and I, it's a very specialized inner tube and I went to two out of the three bike shops here in Larkspur um, looking for it and I mentioned to the owners I'd seen this was on the agenda for tonight and neither of them had heard anything about it uh, and at first were very skeptical but as I explained to them I've done a lot of reading on this uh, because it might affect Sausalito where I work and most of the bike 
uh, shops in areas where the, this kind of program has been set up uh, have been very enthusiastic about it because it helps their sales. People try these out and decide they want to own one. Um, so I would suggest at some point, Tam should approach all the bike shops and that are going to be in the effective area because um, they could be good advocates for you. And also they had a lot of information about bicycle usage uh, and communicating with their customers. The other thing, and just to suggest that maybe the presentation should be done for the Chamber of Commerce, because uh, I would think a lot of the employers are going to have employees who might want to take advantage of it. And all of them might have a lot of questions about uh, the bikes being outside their shops and uh, any of those elements that might occur once you're farther along and you know how many bikes are going to be in the city. Um, but I'm looking forward to it. I think it's a great step. Thank you. Great. Thank, thanks, Kevin. Anyone else in the public? Looking for any further raised hands or any emails, public comment. And there is no further public comment. Okay, well, with that, I think I'll bring it back to the council. Um, and unless there are further comments or questions on this item, I'll look for a motion. I'll move, Mr. The staff recommendation, Mr. Mayor. Okay, and that's to approve resolution 2821, um, authorize, authorizing the city manager to enter into this um, interagency agreement. Um, we'll second. second. Okay, Catherine, seconds. Let's have a vote. Council Member Candell? Yes. Council Member Paulson? Yes. Council Member Way? Yes. Vice Mayor Homer? Yes. Mayor Harrock? Yes. And with that, the motion is approved. And that will bring us to the end of that matter. And we'll take us on to agenda item 8.2. And we will be getting back into the nitty gritty of our budget. Um, so I'll uh, uh, give this off to our city manager to get started. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council members. Um, tonight for the budget presentation, I'll be joined by Administrative Services Director Kathy Orm. Um, we're going to take you through some slides and um, address the written material in your packet. In your packet, you received a report we like to give you at this sort of last workshop before the actual budget hearing uh, that we'll do at our next at your next council meeting. Uh, the report we've given you is called a budget comparison report. It gives you a chance to look at the proposed the preliminary proposed budget for the next fiscal year against the last few fiscal years. So it gives you a chance to really see how things have been progressing or in some respects regressing as we have coped with the pandemic and its impact on our finances. Um, I've provided you with a written memo that summarizes our thinking about uh, trends in the economy and their impact on our budget. And then um, I've also given you what, uh, what's our summary of how we'd like to do business next year and what that means for our budget. Um, it's difficult to not talk about this upcoming fiscal year without also talking about the fiscal year we're in now. Uh, that's always true, but in this particular situation, I, I really feel we've been in a two-year process. And we told you last year that surviving to the end of uh, fiscal year 21-22 would be the goal, uh, that we thought that would be the, the term of the pandemic and its, its impact on us. Uh, we've learned a lot. And I've been so happy in the last few months to tell you we learned a lot because we were wrong about several things. Uh, the economy performed differently than we expected and had a, a better return for the city than we expected. So on a two-year perspective, um, we now think we're gonna close the current fiscal year uh, with some excess revenue, which is effectively a surplus. Um, and that's because of the cuts we made and the management we did on the budget. That's also a reflection of the fact that we couldn't operate all of our divisions at anything remotely approaching their full strength, both because we were making financial changes and because of the impact of the pandemic. Um, 
And then more than anything, it's reflective of the fact that um, sales tax of our revenue streams was the one that uh, we were wrong about the most. And that was because internet sales offset our brick and mortar losses considerably. Uh, so now, as we transition to talking about the next fiscal year, and I use continue to look at this as a two-year process, we can take comfort in the fact that these excess revenues that we were able to generate through our controlled measures for the current fiscal year will help us offset a proposed structural deficit in the upcoming budget. It's a structural deficit because we've built in on purpose more expenditures than we anticipate having revenues for. Um, we've done that because we know the community's desire and our goal is to move the city back to the service levels that the community wants and has enjoyed before the pandemic. Um, and we feel that because we were so cautious and careful in this fiscal year, and because we have a longstanding history of conservative fiscal practice and have built up healthy reserves, that we can assume a slight structural deficit and then cure that deficit in the next couple of years as our revenues rebound back to their normal levels. So that's the strategy that I'm advocating. Um, and we'll go through some of the detail. Uh, Kathy had a good suggestion for this presentation, which is to, as we go through it, we're gonna walk you through what we were projecting last year and what actually happened. And that'll give us a context for what we're recommending as we go forward. So with that, I'm gonna turn on the share screen feature and get my slideshow going. And at any time, please, if you have any questions, let us know. And Kathy, if there's anything you wanna add, please chime in as we go along. Um, so we have our preliminary estimates and projections for the budget and our service levels uh, for next year. Oops. I'm having a little trouble. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so what were we thinking would, uh, what are we thinking now? Um, we're thinking that property tax would generally be flat, although we did take one sizable hit that we talked about in the memo, and that was that the council made a, a decision to invest in a new model for trying to keep rents affordable. And um, that investment was to allow a, a particular joint powers authority to operate in Larkspur. They acquired Serenity, which is a large complex in Larkspur Landing. And as a result, that's become a publicly owned property and won't be on our tax rolls anymore. So we're essentially flat, but we did take one hit this year that, uh, that we'll have to absorb. We do expect sales tax to be uh, slightly down from the current fiscal year. Uh, we're gonna be down for several years from the levels we were starting to enjoy before the pandemic. But slightly down is in the 2.4 and 2.5 million dollar range. And you may recall that last year at this time, we were projecting sales tax would be more in the 1.7 and 1.8 million dollar range. So uh, from that perspective, that's a rosy picture. Uh, we're still expecting transient occupancy tax to be down as much as 80% from its height. Um, but we're hoping to see that begin a slow and steady rebound. Here is the proposed budget in sum. Uh, you have a version of this in your packet. Um, and as you can see, we are anticipating that revenues will be roughly uh, 17 and a half million across all our primary revenue sources. So um, that's actually overall a slight increase from where we think we will uh, land for the current fiscal year. It's not a good presentation from us if we don't give you a good pie chart uh, showing how we do things. So we'll start with revenue. Uh, as we like to remind the council, and this is the good visual reminder, we are a property tax based agency. Uh, although sales tax is often what we talk about because sales tax helps us in the margin, our bread and butter is property tax. And you can see that that remains a strong and healthy part of our pie. 
Uh, through the mayor, Dan, can I ask you a question on the previous slide? Sure. So uh, the line item charged for services, um, can you just describe how that, uh, wh where that uh, significant jump up came from? Kathy, you wanna chime in? Certainly, um, most of it, uh, the charge for services is the planning and, <clears throat> excuse me, planning and building department. So um, as Director Toff has said, they've, <clears throat> they've, had, um, they've been busy and even though they haven't been doing big projects, um, they are proven that they are doing, doing well. They have also changed um, how they're taking in the revenue stream. We're um, not holding things in deposit as much. So we're actually recognizing our revenue sooner. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, so what were we did talking about? And I, I missed this slide should have been labeled what we said. So this is what we said last year that we were gonna reduce our uh, base pay across all employees by 10%. And we were gonna hold vacant a number of positions. And that's what we did to begin the year. Um, and we dealt with the fact that we had furloughed our employees for 10% of their scheduled hours. Uh, most, the most significant impact in terms of holding positions vacant was in the library. That was partly budgetary, but that was also partly because we knew the library would have to operate in a more constrained fashion during COVID. Um, so we also knew that in total, we would be able to reduce our staffing costs by roughly a million dollars. That was a combination of the furloughs and then the council will recall, you authorized an incentive, a retirement incentive program. We actually had several employees take us up on that offer and we were able in combination to save roughly a million dollars last year in our staffing uh, costs. I would say um, of that million dollars, we've uh, on the side in terms of positions, we will probably permanently capture roughly half of the, the staffing reduction costs, which were about 250,000. So we will permanently capture about 250,000 of those staffing cost reductions because uh, one, we, we eliminated the child care center, which we um, is now uh, an after school center that's being run uh, by Court of Madeira in conjunction with the school district. And then uh, the other thing is we permanently eliminated a few positions uh, and so we'll capture those savings. And we did that by changing how we're doing business. And I'll talk about that later. And then the council, you'll recall, and I have another reminder of this later because it is something we need to keep in mind. Uh, we refinanced our bonds, uh, refinanced our pension costs by doing pension obligation bonds last year. Uh, and then we actually arranged those bonds so that we were only making uh, interest only payments for the first two years. And that was so that we could achieve some relief during COVID. Uh, so we do have a, a balloon, if you will, looming in the future where we have to start paying against the principal of the bonds. Here's the general fund in more detail um, on the expenditure side. So, um, you can see that um, the department heads are working hard to keep their budgets as flat as possible. And almost all the increases that you see are contractual obligation increases. Uh, we are also working very hard at the moment to, um, to try to figure out what's happening in a couple of our JPAs. Um, they're having some late discussions um, and I'll note later, but I'll mention it here, both our police and fire JPAs are negotiating with their employees. So we, we don't have complete certainty of what our costs will be there, but with programming what we believe are, are the correct costs. So. Here's a pie chart, because again, I like the pie chart. So uh, you'll note the orange and uh, light blue, that's your public safety. So uh, roughly half your pie goes to public safety. And that's actually pretty healthy. There's a lot of cities where you're gonna see uh, the piece of the pie going to public safety can be two thirds or three quarters of the pie. Uh, and that's reflective, I think, of the fact that we do capture a lot of 
fiscal efficiency through our joint powers authority arrangements. Uh, Kathy's put together for several years to show you uh, how our pension costs have affected the budget uh, and how they've been going up um, in terms of the rates. What's nice here is you can see that uh, we've had a plummet, if you will, in terms of our rates. And that's a, re a reflection of the fact that Larkspur and uh, Central Marine Police are, have gone through the process of issuing pension obligation bonds. And I was reminded by council member Catherine Way, who is on the police council, uh, that I need to celebrate that the bonds came in for Central Marine Police and they beat us. They got a better interest rate than Larkspur did. Um, which was reflective of their timing of when they went in the market and the stunning fact that all three member agencies were given uh, AAA ratings. And so the authority achieved a AAA rating, which we didn't an necessarily anticipate going into the process. So um, the authority, as an aside, just to celebrate it for a moment, uh, will realize over 20 years a um, $14 million dollar reduction in interest payments because of the bond issuance. So I think I have that right, Kathy, right? Yes, that sounds right. Yeah. So going forward, pension costs directly to CalPERS um, are going to be reflective of our actual costs for our, our employees. Um, and so you'll see increases as PERS adjust the rates to reflect what's going on in the markets. But um, we will have effectively paid off uh, the, the accrued liability by shifting it into the bonds. Uh, and that's reflected in this slide. So thank you, Kathy. I got ahead of the slides that Kathy put this one in to really illustrate for you. The blue and the red are your uh, pension costs. And they've now shifted to the green bar, which is the pension obligation bond costs. So um, we're still paying, uh, but over 20 years, we're going to save a lot of money because we're not going to be paying CalPERS interest rate of seven and a quarter. We're going to be paying our bond rate, which is roughly 3%. So that's a significant savings that uh, many of you have also enjoyed as you refinance mortgage and other debt during this period of low interest rates. I just got to say, I love love that slide because it's so visual about how much really saving is in the long run with PERS. I mean, and how it keeps creeping up and then all of a sudden you're like. Yeah, we, we get to control it now. So uh, right. this kind of stuff that gets Kathy really excited. <laughs> and all the rest of us too. <laughs> so this is the part of the presentation where I thought it'd be good to remind it ourselves what we said last year and then tell you what actually has happened and that'll fuel our discussion as we afterwards of opening it up to you you know last year we were worried that we would have to close the gap by pulling from reserves and we had asked for authorization that if necessary we could draw from two different reserves we could draw from the transient occupancy tax fund reserve uh, that's the hotel tax that we usually use to invest in the business community we had built up a nice reserve in that to fund programs. Uh, we didn't have to draw on that money. We don't anticipate having to draw on that money. So that'll be available again next year as a potential reserve to look at potential investment in economic development in the business community. Um, although I do think when you hear from uh, Julian Skinner in his next presentation, he's gonna mention that some of that might be a good investment for options in the downtown corridor plan. Uh, and then we had actually suggested to you that uh, we were concerned we would have to draw at least 600000 in the first year from the general fund reserve, and we're not at this time anticipating that we'll have to do that. So that's pretty exciting. It means we're still in a strong position to weather uh, the remaining storm of the pandemic and whatever comes next. Uh, last year, we told you we would preserve the 25% general fund reserve, but we were on pace where we would have to rely heavily on a draw from the reserves for fiscal year 22. 
because we're going to finish with excess revenue or a surplus in our current fiscal year, that's actually going to offset a lot of the structural deficit and the draw off reserves will be very, very modest, if at all. Uh, you always have to go into every budget session remembering, Kathy and I tend to assume a lesser performance than reality because that keeps us on the right track. So we're going to hope that's what we've assumed again this year. Uh, what we said last year about services, um, you know, we made a commitment that emergency response wasn't going to be impacted by us financially, uh, but that we we did tell you we thought our parks, our medians, our landscaping would all suffer because we would be reducing our, our guys by from uh, f five days a week to four. Um, and what happened? We kept emergency response fully staffed. They certainly had their challenges. It was a difficult year, a lot going on in the world. So some service level impacts occurred, but they were more related to what was going on in the world and not finances. Uh, we have seen the effect of the fact that we did furloughs in maintenance. We're, we're a little behind, we're playing catch up. Um, today I got an email saying, when are we gonna weed some of the medians? Um, and we're gonna to get to them, but uh, it's just been challenging. We've been uh, make, trying to make up for all that lost uh, productivity uh, that our maintenance crews experienced with uh, the furlough program. But I am pleased to say we have our full staff of maintenance workers, and this is probably the longest, I'm jinxing us, but this is probably the longest period we've done with full staff in quite a while. Um, we told you we would be able to maintain the uh, engineering staff, uh, but one of the things we'd be doing was shifting more of our cost recovery into the billing for the projects we do, which might make less money available for construction. That's all generally came to pass, although uh, our construction budgets proved fairly robust and we've been able to keep all our projects on target. What did we say about planning last year? We were worried that with the reduction in staff, we'd have longer response times for inquiries. We might have slower processing time and uh, we may have to ask applicants that if they wanted things sped up, they'd need to pay a third party. And we were very concerned that we'd have much slower response to code enforcement complaints. Um, so we were right. Uh, we were a little slower, particularly early on in planning. Um, but I do think things improved considerably as we automated processes. And I want to thank the council again for authorizing funds being released so we could invest in automation. Um, We've made a lot of strides there, and I think our workforce is a lot more nimble now than they were before, um, and we're seeing the results and the productivity increased. Uh, we did struggle with code enforcement, and we really took it down to the bare minimum of responding to the most egregious matters. Um, this is actually something that we're restoring right now. We've had you authorized a contract with the company that we've used in the past to support code enforcement. We have now a person here twice a week doing code enforcement. And in fact, he was here today um, and we are actually addressing uh, a property that's been a concern for us for a while uh, because we now have the manpower to go out and do that. Uh, what we said last year about, whoops, about the building division, sorry, took my thing. Um, so something similar, we'd probably be a little slower and, and that was the case. Um, want to really acknowledge Jim Kerrigan, our, our permit tech. Um, but for the last several years, we've been so busy. We've had two people in that role. Uh, one of our permit techs retired um, and he really worked hard to limit the, the length of the response times as best he could uh, and um, process permits as quickly as he could. I know we had some tro troubles early on, but I think we hit our stride once we were able to automate a few of those procedures. Um, as the council heard me say before, uh, it didn't slow down in building, which surprised us. Although what we were processing changed a lot. We did a heck of a lot of solar permits, for example, last year. Everybody got very excited about having work done on their homes and particularly things that could be done outside uh, were popular. So did a lot of pro uh, permits there. 
when permit tech is programmed, actually say that second permit tech position is programmed into this budget. And we are requesting with the approval of the budget that we'd be authorized to restore that second position. So we'd get those staffing levels back to the responsiveness we need. The council also authorized, we're using an interim person right now to get us through the spring months, which is often some of our busiest times. So we think the public will enjoy uh, a return to the service levels they're accustomed to in, in building. Uh, in admin, we told you we were going to actually increase our efforts in some of our resources for communication and general support. And we did do that. Um, we think that was really helpful to help to improve getting the message out and with folks in shelter in place, it was particularly critical to keep pushing out information. Uh, I want to thank assistant to the city manager, Shannon O'Hare, who spearheaded that effort. Um, but it's a real team effort and she draws on a lot of the staff to, to help her uh, get the information she needs to put out. Um, but we've not pushed some of those special issues and projects as easily as we would like because we've been in a reduced staff position. And in fact, I think um, the public comment in the timing of that particular issue that the speakers are asking about is sort of reflective of we have a backlog of key issues that we're slowly working our way back through as we restore our own service levels and administration. And we have to prioritize those to make sure that we get them to the council in a way that's appropriate so that there's sufficient public engagement on all of these issues. Um, and so, um, you know, it's not that we don't want to do all of these things. We just have to be strategic in the use of our resources. Uh, library, you know, library and recreation are the two areas most impacted by the pandemic, both for budgetary purposes and operating restrictions. COVID-19 really restricted the library. Um, but what surprised us more than anything was how popular curbside service at the library became. Uh, and trying to do that on a shoestring staff was pretty challenging. And I want to acknowledge the entire library staff for the hard work and effort they put in to provide that service at a time when it was sorely desired. Uh, we're now seeing the COVID-19 restrictions lifted, um, but we're not at a, a staffing level yet where we can uh, be as open as we would like. So we're open to the public on a limited basis twice a week. And that'll continue till we can get some more staff people on board. We're actually doing some interviews for part-time people Friday and we'll be, we're in a recruitment for another librarian. So as we get these people back on board, we'll be able to start to increase the offerings to the public. Uh, and of course, we uh, started to split the attention of the director because uh, we asked him to manage both the library and recreation divisions in what we were calling our interim community services department. And this budget is proposing that we make that permanent. Uh, and then so going to what happened, um, as I said, we're slowly restoring those library positions. The budget in front of you does hold one. We normally staff three librarians underneath the library director or underneath the community services director. Um, this budget only funds two librarian positions. We're going to hold one vacant and we're going to wait till mid-year to see how we're doing before we discuss whether we can afford to fill the third librarian spot. Um, it's been challenging to be responsive to the public, uh, so that proved to be true, and, and as I said, we have actually realized limited hours. But I think overall we're starting to see the potential for efficiencies by having the community services department, and I think this year you're going to see that even more. This budget that's before you will include funding for a new position, a community services anal, um, assistant, and that's a person that the director can deploy in either recreation or in the library based on demand. And those two operations have seasons when their, their need for staffing goes up. And so having some people that we hire probably based heavily on their customer service skills will allow us to, to move that person back and forth based on need and demand. I think that's a position we'll be looking at filling in one or two uh, people in the future. 
in recreation, a similar story. What we said last year, we were going to really have to cut back, and we did. Um, we weren't able to do a lot of uh, our programming and rentals, and we didn't think we'd do very many city managed events. Um, and then what happened? Um, we are at extremely low staffing levels in rec. We've never run a high staff level um, because we rely a lot on contractors. Um, what we're doing now uh, is uh, actually shifting even more to a contractor model. So our in-house staff essentially will be transitioning to being more, um, more administrative and less hands-on and we'll be uh, essentially offering our programming through a model where the, the instructors and the people who actually are facilitating the activity are uh, doing so through a contract with the city. Uh, and do want to remind council, you know, what we said last year is we were going to do quarterly reviews. We had actually almost weekly reviews at one point in the first quarter of the fiscal year. Uh, and then we have probably really done more like monthly, if not um, every five or six weeks, uh, updated you on different financial issues throughout. And we've had a standing issue to just tell you what's going on COVID related and how it's impacting the budget. And then we did say, you know, if, if things were looking better, we wanted to try to scale back up. Um, and I really want to note uh, for the community uh, and our own workforce, um, you know, thank you to the council because um, as those revenues started to rebound, um, you did authorize the restoration of work hours and we did start authorizing positions to come back. So, um, you know, it, it's always the hardest to uh, make promises when you're in an unknown situation and then live up to those promises. And thank you to the council for doing that this year. There are some keep in minds because I always have to have words of caution in any presentation I give you about the budget. And this is, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up here shortly. Um, so as I mentioned, there is a structural deficit. We are asking you uh, to approve a budget next at your next meeting where we are proposing uh, revenues will be will fall short of expenditures. Uh, but we are thinking of this as more of a two-year process and we're recognizing that revenues exceeded expenditures or we expect them to when we close the books on the current fiscal year. That structural deficit will probably take a few extra years to cure as I mentioned. And by curing, I mean, we have to hold the line on expenditures and let our revenues continue to rebound. As they rebound, they should exceed the deficit that we're talking about. The revenue stream we expect to be most responsible for that is the hotel tax. Once the hotel tax rebounds, it'll easily offset what we're proposing. Uh, as I mentioned, this budget is the one that has to take the hit because of the investment the council made in the program to stabilize and make rents more affordable at Serenity. You know, you'll recall you, you didn't know which property or properties might be acquired by the Joint Powers Authority that uh, promotes this stabilization program. It happened to be Serenity was what they acquired after you authorized them to operate in Larkspur. Um, and, you know, you only have to really absorb that once because then they're off the books and we've dealt with it. But this is the fiscal year we have to do that. Uh, and then uh, we should rem keep in mind that in, in the fiscal year, not this budget, but the one after, that's when we have to start paying that principal against the pension obligation bonds. So we'll see an increase there that we need to be prepared for. And as I mentioned before, we need to be cognizant that our public safety labor groups are both at the negotiating table right now. So we've, we've been advised by those entities what our uh, current anticipated charge will be, and that's what's programmed into the budget, but both entities may be coming back with adjustments after they've finished their negotiations. Kathy, is there anything you wanna add before I open it up? No, well covered and much appreciation to the council for um, allowing us to bring you a budget with a structural deficit with an understanding of that we're being very cautious again 
And if it wasn't for, you know, the property tax, we would have a balanced budget, but we'll, we're doing fine and um, we'll make it up. Well, thanks. Right. Thank, that thanks. Turns it over to you. Thanks to you, Kathy and Dan, for that great presentation, and even more so for your stewardship over the budget um, during this past year, which has, you know, presented unprecedented uh, challenges um, that uh, that you two did a great job anticipating um, and preparing for, and I think we're reaping uh, some of the benefits now. Um, and looking forward into the future from the hard work that you put in right at the outset. And I, I wish every city and town in the, in the, in the state um, were as uh, careful as you guys have been this year. So thank you so much for everything you've done to keep us on track. Any, uh, uh, I see Catherine Way's uh, hand is up. Uh, yes. Go ahead, Th thanks again for a very thorough presentation. It's always I think our financial statements have become clearer and clearer in the last uh, five to 10 years. Um, and I think the, the process you've put in, Kathy, has really made them easier to understand for someone with a non-finance background. Um, can you comment on, or do you know what the American Rescue Act funds, uh, if we will be receiving those, or is it still unclear at this point? And is there a timeline Kathy and I can tell you what we understand as of today. Um, and Kathy attended a briefing, I think today, mm -hmm. so she might have even more information, but this is what I understand as of right now. The federal, the Department of Treasury and the bill itself identified what they call entitlement cities and non-entitlement cities. Entitlement cities, the first line is whether you have 50,000 residents or more. Uh, so in Marin County, there's only two cities that qualified as entitlement cities, Nevada and San Rafael. So an entitlement city is going to get paid from the Department of Treasury, from, from the federal government. And there's a table they can go look at to see what their supposed allocation is. The non-entitlement cities, uh, so the small cities, that's us. Yeah. Our money is being sent to the state of California. And all the entitlement cities throughout the country, their, their uh, projected amount that the federal government used in its formula got lump sum combined in aggregate and sent to the states. This, and I think I got this right today listening to what Kathy heard on the briefing that she shared with me. The states, once they receive the lump sum payments, they have 30 days to disperse that money, but they are under no obligation to follow the methodology that's being used for the entitlement cities. So each state essentially gets to decide what's an appropriate allocation methodology for that state. Um, the League of California Cities is very engaged at the moment with the legislature trying to figure out what their intent is. I'm completely speculating because I, this is my long way of saying we, we could get nothing or we could get something. Um, I seriously doubt we will get the amount we saw in a table like four or five months ago, just because um, the pandemic has affected the state different ways. California is a big state. And I think as much as I like to gripe about Sacramento, I don't envy them this task. They now have to take this big pot of money and figure out who's gonna win and who's gonna lose. Do I think we're gonna get something? Yes, but what that amount is, I, I don't know. I would say you could tell any constituent or group that's asking you for money, it isn't gonna be enough to pay for a lot of these things that folks were hoping we would be able to pay for. Well, that's actually a really good point because people are knocking on doors with their hands out and we need to know what to say. Um, uh, anything else, Catherine? Oh, no, that's fine. Thanks. I just, I, I think that the, um, the way we were able to refinance our pension obligation debt, um, I think we owe a lot of, of um, kudos to ex-council member Larry Chu, who really did a lot of the research on that 
and brought forward this innovative idea that I think is now being accepted in so many other communities and agencies. So um, when I see him, I'll, I'll commend him again. Okay, so two other hands. Let's start with Council Member Paulson. Great, thank you, Mayor. Um, just a couple things. Um, first, I wanted to you know thank you, uh, Dan and, and Kathy both. I really, not only you know did you manage the budget prudently, but I you know endorsed risks you know prudent risks now. So the fact that we haven't tapped into transfer occupancy tax and and you know will go into a little bit of a deficit with some backstops is, you know, seems really reasonable and a good thing. Um, I did want to put on the Dan Schwartz hat for a second and say, you know, I want to be the pessimist here. So I'm wondering what your threshold is, at which point, you know, you would, you would come back and say, um, you know, not as rosy as we thought. Like, I'm wondering, you know, if, if we went into transfer occupancy for 250,000 or, you know, at what point do you feel um, in these parameters where, where you would kind of reverse course. Um, and then the second question I had was continuing with what, you know, Catherine had said, I'm a little bit concerned about some of the unfunded projects, which I think Julian might talk about next. And, you know, so I, I know that we're just getting out of COVID, but just looking ahead, um, I'm wondering to what extent beyond the American Rescue um, funding, you know, we're, we're, we're still thinking about a sales tax like the, the Measure R that San Rafael did or um, you know, possibly you know, the charter city possibility, which I think was worth maybe $200,000 of annual revenue. So if, if that factors into any of these calculations or you know, the risk management. Uh, so let me start with uh, when I would get concerned. Um, I think I would be concerned if I thought that the sales tax was trending way off of what the projection we've worked up with our consultant HDL. So all through the year, I'd be monitoring that. Again, even though we're a property tax town, it's the margins we achieve in sales tax that realize opportunity for the city. That's where we're able to pay for the extras, so to speak, or we're able to pump money in our community services the way we want to. So that's, I would start to get worried if I didn't think we were gonna realize the 2.5 mark that we're programming into the budget. And you have to remember, it's tough because we were starting to, I think had the pandemic not come, Kathy and I were close to suggesting 2.8 or 3 million was actually where the Larks for sales tax base had moved. Uh, so to tell you for the next several years, it's 2.5 is actually us telling you the base is down by half a million dollars for a while from where we thought it would be. And that's a context for people to understand. We're talking strangely that it's a rosy situation because it's not as bad as I thought it would be. But it's not great to be down half a million dollars in what your base assumption was pre-pandemic. So, so that's, and that's what we're just gonna have to wrestle with for a while. And, and if I ever got a chance to be in the room with a legislator about the American Relief money or whatever pot of money they're considering because let's also remind ourselves the state's enjoying a massive surplus this year um all the cities i suspect have similar stories where we may have figured out how to survive but we're not going to see the same levels of revenue for a while um so um that's the fund i would monitor most closely um, I think the hotel tax projection is probably right. We've stayed very conservative there. And we'll just be happy if things come back faster than we anticipate that they will. Um, I realize occupancy is better, I'm hearing, at the Marriott than we thought, but I don't think he's realizing the rack rate that he was before the pandemic. So. No. And that's where our revenue is based. It's not occupancy. It's what he's what what the Marriott's getting uh, is critical to us. Um, so I hope that addresses sort of that first, like where's my, my tension point. Um, and then when we get to the CIP and we start to talk about unfunded projects, part of a CIP is to have all those unfunded projects documented because when you endorse a CIP, you're not just endorsing the projects we're working on, you're telling us what 
projects you want us to go scrape the barrel for money for, whether that's Kathy and Julian and, and Dan sitting in a room hashing it out about which pot of money is actually available that we could propose, or it's Julian's team finding a grant that makes sense for the city. You know, that by you approving an unfunded project, you're telling us that project valuable, even though we can't yet tell you how we wanna pay for it. So um, that's an important context when we look at, at the CIP. Um, and then lastly, one, one fund I'm, going to be uh, working a lot on this year is the uh, other sales tax fund, our Measure B fund. Um, as is our nature, we were very careful when we issued bonds that were paid for out of Measure B. So our commitment is about 1.6 million annually from the Measure B fund. Even with the depressed economy of COVID, we're well in excess of 1.6 million. So we're starting to build up revenue in reserve and measure B. And I think this will be the year through your oversight committee that will want to bring forward some ideas on how to employ that money. And you'll recall that when you went to the voters, we knew there were unfunded needs, such as storm drains that needed to be addressed. And so now we mentioned several of those to the voters in that measure. And so now's the opportunity to pull that list out and say, how do we put that money creatively to work? And then I think the question that we get to for council, that addresses what you're saying, Councilmember Paulson, is how urgent are some of these other needs? And if they're as urgent as we may feel they are, how do we talk to the constituents, the voters about that? And we talk about potential solutions. Um, and that's a process and a conversation that I think will be the next 12 to 18 months. So it's on our radar. It's one of the things we're working on quite a bit. Great, thanks for that. Okay, anything else? I thought I saw Vice Mayor Helmer had his head up before, but I don't see it's up now. Uh, my question was answered. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and great job, staff. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like he's walking through a I think, tunnel. I think Dan needs to plug plug himself back in again. <laughs> Thanks. I think that was the highlight of the evening. <laughs> there was an entertaining as a guy cat. He's he's still going, don't. <laughs> It's pretty windy here tonight. Maybe his, uh, maybe his. I think, polls... I, I think he's. No, he's. No, he's still going. I guess I'll leave this to you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know if I can get him on chat. I think he's done. I think so. Um, but those were those were those were illuminating comments. So we appreciate it very, very I'm, much. I'm oh, on the road. Sorry, oh, thank you. Oh, that's okay. That's all right. We didn't hear a word you said. So if you're back, if you're back in in voice control, you can try again. It looks like he's totally gone now. I think he is totally gone. All right. Well, so much for that. Uh, anything else from uh, the council? Again, just to reiterate um, our collective um, expressions of thanks for your your um, for your guiding through us through a difficult physical fiscal time, and we will look forward to um, uh, seeing the final budget and hopefully approving it. Like I said, our next meeting. That is our plan. We'll be bringing it to your next meeting. Um, we uh, really worked last year to improve the budget book appearance uh, and and just make it a little more readable. Um, and want to thank Kathy and Shannon O'Hare, they, 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 the team making that happen. This year, they've refined the process, and I anticipate they're going to publish the budget book within the next several working days after taking any feedback tonight, um, which I think is a record for us. So we'll publish the budget book before, the draft budget book before the end of May. Okay, terrific. Need lots of graphs. Um, 
Okay, anything else from the council? I don't think this is an, an action item. This is just a report out before we get into the, the, the real show next time around. Um, seeing none, are there any, uh, any comments from the public on uh, the presentation tonight on budget? Looking for any raised hands from our audience members or any emailed public comment. And there is no public comment. Okay, great. Well, I think that uh, that will then conclude the presentation. And as I said, we'll look forward to seeing um, the final uh, package uh, next time, next time around. Um, so I think that's part A of 8.2. Um, I think we need to move on to part B, which is proposed capital improvement program for fiscal year 2021-22. Uh, so I guess we'll take a presentation on that. Okay, um, I will take that from here. Um, okay, so thanks, Julian. Julian Skinner again, uh, Public Works Director. Um, share my screen. Okay, so uh, tonight we have a run through of the proposed capital improvement program. Um, as the city manager mentioned, we do a five year program looking at all the projects we anticipate um, that are funded and some that are not funded over the next five years. Um, and then when this comes back to you for approval with the rest of the operating budget, um, we'll also be asking you to make those allocations for uh, the 21-22 fiscal year projects. So um, it's a five-year program, but you're only approving uh, the actual allocations for uh, one fiscal year at a time. Um, so we'll do a little bit of background on the CIP, talk about what we look after and how we determine what needs uh, to be taken care of in the CIP, where the funding comes from, and then get into some of the projects. Um, it's a snapshot of um, the bulk of um, what you'll see in, in our capital programs is taking care of our 33 miles of pavement. And just as a reminder that it's not just a pavement, um, the street lights, traffic signals, retaining walls, all of those things um, that we need in order for people to be able to use the, the streets are um, included in our maintenance responsibilities too, um, as well as the 15 miles of storm drains that are uh, mostly buried beneath those uh, streets. Uh, we also take care of improvements at our uh, parks at Piper Park and then the 10 mini parks we have um, and then the nine buildings that the, the city owns. Um, and so we have a number of studies um, and documents and there are grant programs um, that we use um, to develop the projects in the CIP. Um, we have condition studies on our uh, streets. They get rated every two years uh, physically. Somebody goes around and determines the condition of our streets and that um, leads us into uh, determining which streets need to be repaved and when. Uh, we have condition assessments of our bridges, stairs, buildings, um, storm drains, retaining walls, um, so that we can plan for uh, repairs and replacements, um, hopefully before we get into failures. Um, and then we have a number of uh, documents that look at improvements rather than repairs and replacements, such as our bike and ped master plan. And then we have master plans uh, for Piper Park as well as for the uh, mini parks. And then from time to time, there are grant opportunities that come up that are specific to bicycle or pedestrian improvements. And so we look for uh, projects that fit certain uh, grants that are available. Um, and then from time to time, we do run into something that um, fails that wasn't anticipated and we have an emergency uh, need to repair or replace something that leads to a capital project. Um, and this is where the funding comes from um, that pays for most of these projects as opposed to the, uh, the general fund slides and, and pie charts that, um, that you saw in the operating budget. We have a more finite um, slew of, of funding. Um, these are the main categories. There are some other smaller ones, um, but I just wanted to touch on them a little bit. Um, some of them are um, steadier than others and more consistent streams and, and others kind of come and go. Um, grants, we obviously have a huge grant right now that's paying for most of the Bonaire Bridge replacement. So that's a, a big chunk of our funding. 
Um, and then from time to time, there are uh, Transportation Development Act uh, grants. And then we also received a Safe Pathways to Schools grant for some improvements on, on Doherty. Um, and then gas tax, which um, is in some sense a, a, a stable revenue, but um, it has been declining over the years as uh, vehicles become more fuel efficient and uh, people trend to hybrid and electric vehicles. Uh, gasoline sales go down and accordingly our uh, gas tax revenue uh, goes down, but it has been bolstered as of late by SB1, uh, which is giving us a, another boost of, of, of gas tax funds. Um, the citywide paving fund is the, the bond proceeds that is being repaid with the measure B sales tax. So that's primarily funding our paving program at the moment. Um, and then there is a regional transportation sales tax in Marin County that's run by Transportation Authority of Marin. Um, it was 10 measure A, it's now 10 measure double A um, that we get uh, funds each year towards our, our local streets. And there's also TAM looks after the uh, Measure B, which is a vehicle registration fee that we get funds every three years from that $10 surcharge on uh, vehicle registrations. Um, County Parks uh, Measure A is uh, set to expire in early 2023. Um, so that's also a, a countywide sales tax that has been giving us roughly $90,000 a year that we've been putting into improving our parks. Um, and so I know the county is actively strategizing on the best time to go uh, back out to the voters to uh, extend or renew um, that parks, um, parks sales tax. Um, the vehicle impact fee is a combination of uh, fees that are charged on larger construction projects. Um, and then also we do have a refuse franchise fee that's uh, charged to the waste hauler for the impact of the, the trucks on the streets. Um, and then PGE e Rule 20A um, is very unsteady at the moment. There's some um, activity going on with the CPUC that's looking to sunset that program. Um, basically, we get about $50,000 a year currently in credits towards undergrounding projects, and the CPUC is looking uh, at terminating that program or translating it into some different uh, mechanism. So uh, we do have a current active project that is funded with uh, Rule 20A. So that project's somewhat on hold at the moment um, as we wait for the um, CPUC and, and PG&E to work through the details of the disposition of, of those funds. And then the last one is restricted revenue. That's kind of a, a catch-all. We have a number of agreements with other agencies and sometimes we get private donations. Uh, you'll see a couple of projects that uh, we have that are uh, utilizing those uh, monies that come in from other sources. Um, and so the projects that you see are typically uh, not routine maintenance. They're larger projects that are beyond what we can deal with, with our um, in-street maintenance crews, uh, typically replacements or large scale uh, rehabilitations. Uh, some of them can span uh, multiple, uh, multiple years. Uh, so what we do is we match the funds that we get with the funding sources that I showed you on the previous slide with the needs that we have from uh, all of those assessments and condition reports. Uh, and then we go through a prioritization um, analysis because we have way more needs than we have funding for. And so a lot of those studies do prioritize projects and put them in a ranking order of what needs to take place first. Um, and then every year we take another look and uh, reevaluate our uh, priorities and we match the funds uh, the best we have to the projects that we think need to be done sooner um, rather than later. Um, and then the other projects um, get either programmed for a future year in the capital program when we think we're gonna have uh, funds available or they go on a list of unfunded uh, projects and then we search for grants or other opportunities to, uh, to fund those. Um, so I'll start um, here with the projects. I'll kind of highlight the ones that are getting new funding this year, but I will go over some of the um, other ones that are in there too. Uh, we break our projects down into three categories, buildings, parks, and uh, streets and utilities. First category is buildings. We only have one active project at the moment. We have a number of unfunded projects, but there's only one uh, project that's active in the CIP. Uh, we did some um, drainage studies at Fire Station 16 in Greenbrae. Uh, we had some seed funding uh, in a previous fiscal year to look into some water intrusion issues at that building. Um, and so um, that the, the fixes that are needed for that building um, haven't been funded yet. We think there's about another $300,000 that would be uh, needed in addition to some more studies to 
uh, make sure we're spending uh, that money as the, the best needs of that, that building are. So um, that's the loan project that's uh, in the building category. I will mention that we're currently updating some of the studies at City Hall. Uh, we've had uh, some condition studies in the past identifying some of the deficiencies in, in City Hall and uh, we anticipate, anticipate getting an updated um, study. We know of some uh, things that could do with some improvements at, at City Hall, uh, but that's one of those unfunded projects um, that you're not seeing in here because there's no funding uh, program for it at this time. Julian, before you move on, I just wanted to share with the council that Central Marine Fire uh, has commissioned an analysis of all of its fire stations. Um, and that analysis is both to study the operational need of the four stations and also the condition of the four stations. And so it, we've provided the information that uh, Julian's staff commissioned in the past about uh, the condition at our stations. Um, but one reason I've been hesitant to move forward with the improvements to Fire Station 16 in Greenbrae or the, the, the repairs is waiting to see if there's a long-term vision generated at Central Marine Fire that might affect our, our thought process with respect to this investment. So I do expect that study will move along quickly in the next uh, several months at Central Marine Fire. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the parks projects. And the, these first few slides are going to be an overview of all of the projects and, and talking about the dollars. And then when we get through the overview charts, I do have some more detailed slides on the individual projects. Um, so looking at the parks projects, um, and again, this is what you're looking at here is the five-year plan. So the project names are on the left. And then each of the columns is a, is a fiscal year and the five-year plan. Um, and the one that is highlighted in yellow um, is the, um, the requested allocation for fiscal year 21-22. So um, in approving the five-year CIP, um, you're approving, um, this is how we are projecting these projects will go over the next five years, but you're also allocating um, the funds as shown in the yellow columns for fiscal year 21-22. And so, um, for the parks projects, we're looking at um, Niven Park, which was originally scheduled for last year, but we deferred it for a year um, due to COVID. So we've already done some um, project development on that, and we're proposing funding it this year to uh, undertake the construction. And then the other project that's in here is Hamilton Park um, improvements. And this one is showing up this year because we've actually had a private donor uh, donator come forward and um, have um, proposed funding the design and ultimately the improvements at Hamilton Park. So we've plugged that in for uh, this fiscal year. Uh, we've already signed the agreement for doing the project development to uh, do the design for what would be uh, envisioned at, at Hamilton, pretty much consistent with the Mini Parks Action Plan. Um, and then uh, we're showing the 100,000 here in anticipation of uh, additional funding coming in to do uh, the improvements. And as you can see, some of the other projects that are in here do have funds that are programmed in outer years, but I will reiterate that the primary funding for these projects is County Parks Measure A. And so as we get to the end of Heatherwood Park here that is shown for next fiscal year, um, that money for fiscal years 23, 24 and on is uncertain at this time, uh, unless um, there is a replacement for an extension of county parks measure A or we find other funding um, elsewhere. And then also we do have a parks and rec commission. So we did share this with them at their April 15th meeting for their feedback on how we were programming the money um, and the projections for future years and priorities also. Moving into the transportation, drainage, and utilities projects. Um, the first one on the list here is um, the fourth and probably final of our big paving projects under Measure B, a big chunk of uh, $7.6 million in, in funding there is proposed for next fiscal year. Um, and then Redwood Highway Bike and Ped uh, project for North. This is uh, an extension of the North-South Greenway. This is one of those projects. I'll show some of the funding later on, but this is one of those projects that's been funded by outside sources, restricted revenue. 
Um, and then crosswalk improvements and Upper Elm um, Avenue Pathway are two new projects that we're proposing this year. Um, as we've been moving along in our paving programs, uh, we've been looking at some of the other features of the roadway that have, have needed improvements and um, in paving Upper Elm and the narrowness and the lack of sidewalks and the old city pathway um, in that area, uh, we determined that that was a facility that um, was worthy of, of being improved. Um, and then also uh, crosswalk improvements. We did a crosswalk study and identified some improvements that we could uh, undertake at some of our crosswalks throughout the city. And so rather than doing those as we went along with the paving project, uh, we've pulled those out to uh, do them all at once to get some uh, cost efficiencies by having that similar work uh, done uh, at some of those intersections. Um, and then the other new project on here is an LED streetlight retrofit. Um, so uh, this would be a project that would um, replace um, the existing high pressure sodium light bulbs in all of our city streetlights uh, with energy uh, efficient technology, LED. Um, and I have a slide on that project um, in a few that'll go into a little bit more detail as to why we're uh, proposing that at this time. Um, and then the other project that's uh, on this sheet that's showing funding this year is East Sir Francis Drake. We got a grant for rubberized asphalt uh, for $115,000. So we're programming that money um, into the project. Um, and then on the second sheet, continuing with our transportation and drainage uh, projects, uh, Doherty Drive Rule 20A. This is another allocation of uh, PG&E Rule 20A funds. This is based on the latest estimate that PG&E have provided us uh, for that project. This is the funding gap that would be needed to, to build that. Um, so that's being programmed into this year. And then the bike and pedestrian path, path improvements project is an ongoing project. It's a five-year cycle. Uh, we basically fund it with uh, some seed money of gas tax each year so we can address any issues that come up with our paths and sidewalks um, that aren't big enough to do a full-blown um, CIP project, but they're beyond what our maintenance crews um, can handle in the, in the course of their duties. So um, this is kind of a, a catch-all for miscellaneous in, improvements in, in those facilities. Um, and then the next project is Magnolia ADA improvements, which we're not showing a funding allocation for at this time. It was previously funded with um, vehicle impact fees for consultant and staff work and with citywide paving fund for paving and, and sidewalk improvements. But as the city manager mentioned, uh, and we'll go into more detail in uh, Monday's special council meeting, uh, as we've identified an opportunity to add some improvements to that project uh, removing and replacing all of the sidewalk and asphalt in those two blocks provides us with a unique opportunity to uh, add some elements to that corridor that would be a lot more expensive to do in the future. So uh, we've done some outreach with the public and the, uh, the business community downtown. Um, we've identified some potential improvements that we can incorporate into that project. Um, but we have not identified a funding source yet. So as part of uh, Monday's uh, workshop on that project, as well as the parklets, we'll be going over what we're contemplating and discussing potential funding sources uh, for those added elements. Um, and moving down to the last project that's on the list here is the public stairs improvements. We've got one more set of handrails to install um, on some of the city staircases and we anticipate uh, based on the previous staircases we've done, we're going to need about another $10,000 to finish that project. So that's requested for the coming fiscal year too. And then as I move on to the last list of projects, these are all projects that are for uh, future years. So you see a lot of pavement maintenance, uh, annual projects um, in the coming years, um, as well as Doherty Drive buffered bike lanes that we have a grant for, um, but we don't get reimbursed from the grant till 23, 24. So that's where we've got it um, slotted in the uh, five-year plan at the moment. Uh, so these are just some drill downs on some of those new projects that I mentioned. This is Niven Park. We did a number of um, outreach um, workshops before COVID hit and got some good feedback from the public on what kind of improvements they'd be looking for at Niven Park. So we're looking at some ADA improvements and refreshing some of the amenities out there, the drinking fountains, as well as some improvements at the playground and some, um, some fencing. Um, Hamilton Park, as I mentioned, is more of a passive park, mainly plantings and a pathway and some benches. And so 
Uh, we'll be working with the person that um, has identified uh, a desire to fund some improvements there. I'm working through the Parks and Rec Commission uh, to plan out uh, some mainly some planting and upgrading um, of that park. Uh, Measure B Group 4, so um, we just uh, opened bids yesterday on Measure B Group 3, so we've got one down to go. Uh, next summer, we would uh, be paving the streets in orange that you see here. That would be the last group. Um, and so the little pie chart at the left there kind of shows you the progression through our paving plan. Um, the orange was the portion of uh, streets we paved in 2019. Uh, the green was 2020, and then the grayish uh, tri uh, pie uh, section there is uh, the streets we'll be paving this summer. So that's only going to leave us that white uh, section left uh, to do in 2022. And here's our tracking of this is the citywide paving fund that um, the plan identified we would need about $25 million to pave all of our streets. And so as we've gone through a number of projects, we're tracking. Uh, what we've actually spent versus what we said we would spend in our $25 million plan. And um, so far, we're running under budget uh, to the tune of about $2 million, and we're about halfway through spending the money. So uh, we've been fortunate with some really good bids, um, bids that have been underneath the engineer's estimate. And I think that kind of uh, goes to what uh, one of the selling points of accelerating the paving uh, program was that we could do some larger projects and get some uh, better pricing on asphalt with the larger quantities. So we've definitely seen um, some really competitive bidding on our paving project, including the uh, project that we opened up yesterday that came in um, under the engineer's estimate. And um, that's about a $900,000 savings versus uh, what we had initially budgeted for in, in the plan. So we will keep tracking that. We have some big projects left to go. Sir Francis Drake um, is projected to be over $2 million. And then next year's is the biggest of the four paving and it's about $8 million worth of paving. So we've got a few more uh, paving projects to get through before we really see how this uh, fund ends up. But so far it's tracking in the right direction. Um, this is the North-South Greenway extension project that I mentioned. So currently uh, Caltrans is working um, on adding a new bike path next to the 101 to Sir Francis Drake um, off-ramp. Uh, it's a photo of on the left or on the right, sorry, of um, them preparing those bents for the new bike path. Um, that project is anticipated to last through this calendar year and then um, next year or shortly thereafter, um, the city would follow up and basically extend where that new pathway touches down on Redwood uh, down alongside Redwood to the Warnham um, overpass, the pedestrian overcrossing. Uh, the limits are shown on the, the sketch um, at the bottom. Um, this, all the funding resides with TAM currently, but TAM typically don't undertake construction projects. So the city would take over this project to administer the construction. Um, and then we would have an agreement with uh, TAM for uh, reimbursement. So that's why this project shows up as a restricted revenue project. Um, and then the uh, crosswalk improvement, this would be throughout town. We've been working with our consultant. They did our uncontrolled crosswalk policy. So we have a toolbox of improvements um, that we could undertake at our various crosswalks throughout town. And uh, this is a photo of uh, the crosswalk that was put in a few years ago um, on Magnolia that has the, the flashing uh, pedestrian activated lights. Um, it doesn't mean we're going to go and put those up everywhere. They're not effective if you put them up everywhere. So uh, we may see a few more of these, but at other locations, it may be more appropriate just to put signage or some enhanced striping or some bulb outs or something like that. So we'll be working with our uh, consultant to identify the best improvements for various crosswalks throughout town. And then the upper Elm pathway, this is a continuation of a project that um, it's probably about 10 years ago that uh, they improved the lower path. Um, these were basically unimproved uh, sections to um, connect um, Elm and, and Bayview um, and the lower section uh, was completed. That's a photo in the middle there of the staircase that was constructed. And um, so now we're looking at the upper path, which is the photo on the far left. Uh, could be a pathway or a combination of a pathway and a stairs. We're just, uh, we're going to start the uh, project development for this uh, and determine what the best improvement is um, for that unimproved pathway. 
And then the LED streetlight uh, retrofit. So as I mentioned, we have about 750 streetlights um, in town. Um, and what we're proposing to do is replace um, all of those fixtures uh, with LED technology uh, for a number of reasons. And I'm sure you've heard there are a number of communities um, around us and as well as throughout the country that have done something similar. Um, LED lights use less electricity. Um, they require less maintenance and the bulbs last a lot longer. Um, and so uh, there is an upfront cost to swap out all the bulbs, but with the money that you save uh, from the electricity and from the maintenance, um, at some point um, you get back to even and you've recouped your, your investment. And the typical life of an LED bulb is about 20 years. So what we're looking at here based on our preliminary numbers is um, it's going to cost up to $300,000 to swap the fixtures out. Uh, and we would save $300,000 on electricity and maintenance over seven years. And then um, after the seventh year, then we're saving forty dollars to $50,000 a year on energy um, expenses. And this is not a new project, but I always throw it in because it's our biggest project. And it just doesn't seem right to talk about our CIP without throwing a bridge photo in. Um, so I, this is a slide from our last update, um, just for those that didn't um, catch the bridge. Um, updated our last meeting, uh, we're about 70% of the way through the construction schedule and we've got about 80% of the work uh, complete and we're currently in a slowdown due to environmental uh, constraints, but on June 15th, uh, they will be back um, on the bridge um, and working hard towards uh, a one week closure on starting on July 12th for putting the girders on the south side and then uh, basically uh, keeping working throughout the rest of the uh, calendar year with the goal of getting the uh, bridge open to traffic in early 2022. Um, every year, uh, as we go through the CIP, we identify projects that are complete and can be dropped off. Uh, we actually did that a little earlier this year. So the first five projects that you see here were in this year's CIP and we've already um, removed them from the CIP. They don't need to be carried over, they've been completed. Um, there's one more project, the central uh, pathway connector uh, that wasn't quite complete when we uh, did the amendment earlier this year. So that will be dropped out of the CIP as it's complete and not carried over to uh, next year. Um, here's another look at the funding. This is again, the projects that are proposed to be funded this year. Um, this chart um, identifies where that funding is coming from. So those funding sources that I shared with you in an earlier slide, um, each of the columns here shows um, which how each project is going to be funded. So for example, if you look at the measure B group four, the biggest chunk of it is in citywide paving plan uh, fund. Uh, so that goes towards the construction, but as has been um, our policy, we use other funds to pay for staff and for consultants and the citywide paving plan fund actually goes into the asphalt that goes on the street. So as you can see in this project, there's a number of other funds uh, that go towards that, um, that project. And so uh, as we look um, at the future years in, in the CIP, one of the um, things we're gonna be focusing on is we are getting to the end of our Measure B program. Uh, we're gonna have our streets in fairly good condition and we're gonna be coming up with a program for uh, taking care of our streets in the long run. Um, again, you know, one of the selling points for accelerating the pavement uh, program was that we would get to a point where we would reduce our ongoing pavement maintenance costs. And so uh, we're going to be um, coming to you later this year with a, a look at what does that mean after we finish with Measure B, what's the best way to take care of that investment we've made um, in our streets. Um, and then also, as the uh, city manager uh, mentioned, some of the other items that we know um, that are kind of next on our list. Um, if there's funding available, we know we have an issue with uh, storm drains. We had a storm drain master plan that identified a number of improvements that should be undertaken. So um, those are the things we're going to be focusing on moving forward is making sure that we can maintain our pavement now that we've paved all the streets where they need to be. Uh, and then figuring out how to uh, pay for some of our other uh, unfunded um, needs such as uh, storm drains. Um, I'm available for questions. I did want to show one other slide. This is our list that the city manager mentioned. We keep a ongoing list of other projects that are not funded. Uh, you'll see we did have some unfunded projects listed by fiscal year in the CIP because there was some anticipation of 
getting funding at some point, but these are um, other projects that don't have any funding um, identified with them and they have not been prioritized either. So this is kind of a running list of um, some of those other projects that um, as we look to future years and always keep in mind whenever there's a, a grant uh, call for projects out. Um, so that's a run through um, of the five-year CIP. I'm available for um, any questions. Thanks, Julian. That's very helpful. Appreciate it very much. Any comments or questions from the council? I see, Catherine, you got your hand raised. Uh, yes, thank you, um, Julian. I, actually, I have three. Um, the Doherty Drive Rule 20A closure, that's between um, Magnolia and Hall Middle School, or is it further extended than that? I'm trying to recall what that looks like. Yeah, there's actually two segments. So it is the Magnolia to Hall segment where there's currently overhead, but it also includes uh, the overhead that's in front of Redwood High School. So that's roughly from um, Lucky to I think the first Riviera Circle intersection. So both of those segments of um, overhead are included in that Rule 20A uh, project. Okay. Um, the second is the Hamilton Park donation. Was that something that we was unsolicited or did it was it a local um, neighborhood group or individual or, or how did that come about or can you share that information um, it was uh, it was an individual who has uh, um, an interest in seeing some beautification at that park um, it wasn't solicited it was somebody who um, approached us that um, had a desire to do some improvements at that park yeah, I, that'd be nice when we do that, if, if the, we can acknowledge that donation um, eventually. I think that would be really good of us to do as a city council. And then lastly, the Upper Elm Path. When they did the Lower Elm Path, there was an encroachment of a swimming pool deck that we had to, that the, you weren't here at the time, the public works director had to negotiate. Um, are you anticipating any encroachments on that upper elm path since the lead of it goes through someone's driveway? Uh, we haven't uh, actually started the project development for that. One of the first tasks will be a boundary survey and a topographic survey mm -hmm. that will identify. Uh, we've walked it a few times and we think we have sufficient width to do what we need to do. We just need to make sure that we're doing those things on the city's right of way um, yeah. and that the, the, the lines um, as things were built match the lines of where property ownership is, but that'll be one of the first tasks that we undertake. Yeah, that, that's always confusing in these paper streets. I remember Helen Heitkamp talking about these pathways and paper streets as really uh, often going through and around and into property lines. So uh, I just, I'll just be uh, curious how that goes. Thanks. Uh, Gabe, go ahead. All right, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, Julian, thanks so much. I just wanted to thank you for the bridge and Measure B. You know, during COVID, I just remember that you know you guys had you know ADA improvements and bridge work and you know street improvement you know, through all that. It really is helping a lot. Um, I just had a couple questions. I, I wanted to ask um, for clarification. You know, on the storm drains. You know, I guess ever since the 2019 presentation in December, it's been on my mind. And um, one of the items, I think it's 21307, the, uh, that, that's the $100,000, is that for the CCTV? I think last meeting you talked about this too, but that seemed to be the very first step you know, to really determine the damage and the risk and you know, what kind of funding might be needed. Um, is, is that all correct, you know, that that is the funding line and that's what's going on? Yeah, so that, um, that project was funded last year and I should have mentioned up front, but um, when we fund a, a project in a fiscal year, if we don't spend all of that money, um, that money gets carried over to the next fiscal year. It's not like an operating budget where you reset to zero July 1st. Um, so that project was um, proposed to do an inspection and a cleaning and, and a video catalog of our storm drain system. And it was funded last year with $100,000. Uh, we haven't really got into the meat of that project yet. And so what's left of that $100,000, which is most of it, will be carried forward into fiscal year 21-22. And we will still follow through with that project 
Um, we're currently working with um, Ross Valley Sanitary District to see if there's some shared services opportunity uh, for us there. They have all the equipment that's needed uh, to do that work. So to the extent it doesn't impact their operations, uh, we feel that's a good partnership uh, to undertake um, a lot of that work. And, and, and would it be correct to say that, that it's gonna be hard to, because I, I remember the number, you know, we have about, um, you know, 12 or 14, you know, million dollars of drain work, which is unfunded. And the high priority is about half of that. So like Redwood Highway at Industrial, you know, Magnolia Avenue, Bon Air Road, you know, the citywide pump stations, Larkspur Plaza Wall. So that, that's $7 million. Is it fair to say that we couldn't even really see what needs to be done until we get this um, CCTV um, assessment done? Um, well, it's going to be a combination. Um, some of the items that were identified in the storm drain master plan um, have been identified as a need based on the age. So for example, a pump station, um, those improvements um, are independent of any pipe inspection. We know those improvements need to take place at the pump stations. Some of the impetus for improving the storm drains is to actually increase their size because they did hydraulic modeling and they've determined that um, there's some street flooding risk um, in having smaller pipes and that um, a larger pipe would uh, better be able to carry the water to the creek, um, which both helps reduce flooding and it also helps with clean water because if, you're, if your pipes are too small and your water is traveling throughout your street, it has more opportunity to pick up um, pollutants. So um, I would say um, it's probably a, a combination. Some of, some of what comes out of the in, inspection uh, reports may actually reveal that uh, we have additional uh, needs that weren't anticipated because the storm drain master plan was pre preliminary looking at the hydraulics of the system and is it big enough and are pipes in the right place. Um, and so what the condition assessment will do is help us prioritize if we identify that, um, you know, we have some sections that have very little useful life in them. Um, and they were scheduled to be upsized in the storm drain master plan, then they would probably rise to the top of, of their uh, category. Okay, great. And one, one last question. So we're currently funding uh, the Cor de Alejo uh, storm drains. Is that the same as the, um, the, the uh, Bon Air Road new pump station? No, so Cor de Alejo was funded um, some time ago. There were some um, overland pipes uh, that didn't go under the street. And so there was an improvement project to reroute those pipes into the street. Uh, so we didn't have to maintain uh, these overland pipes. It was a, a separate from uh, separate from Bon Air. That work has actually been completed other than we now have to remove the pipes from the hillside because they're not needed um, anymore. Um, and speaking of Bon Air, I should mention that, um, you know, the storm drain master plan did include that as, as a need and a cost, but the bulk of that cost uh, is covered by the bridge project. So there's probably a good um, good news, um, about $3 million of that $20 million need is actually already covered by the, the bridge uh, project. Okay, great. Thank you, Julie. Any other uh, comments uh, from the council? Uh, seeing none, we'll open it up to the public. Uh, Allison, do we see anybody teed up for this one. Holding for any raised hand from our audience members or any emailed public comment. And there's no public comment. Mr. Mayor, there was a- There's one written comment. That came in ahead of the meeting and we were able to publish, but it might be a, the appropriate time for the public works director to comment on the, the prior, the written comment that was written comment. for the meeting. Julian, do you have anything you want to say on that one? Yeah, so we uh, did get um, a comment from a resident on uh, Britano Way uh, describing a, a, a drainage issue on, on his street and at, at his property. And uh, we have had conversations with that property owner before, and uh, we spoke with him when we went through the storm drain master plan and um, said we would let the process work through and see what the consultants identified. And the consultants did actually um, identify uh, a drainage improvement need at that location. So 
Uh, the map on the right here is a, uh, an excerpt from the storm drain master plan. The, the blue star is roughly the location of the drainage concern that has been uh, reported. And the drainage master plan does show that there should be some pipe upsizing there. Um, but on the left is our uh, kind of priority list from the storm drain master plan that we work with with the consultant is you can see we um, categorize high, medium, and low priority. And um, the yellow arrows here point to projects that have uh, already started in one way or another. Some of them we've just started the design and some of them the construction. Um, so we're hitting the high priorities first. And then we have some of the medium priorities. And this particular location was identified at the time as a, a low priority. It, it says Elysio Drive in the chart, but that's uh, the name the consultants gave to uh, the improvements proposed for this area, even though this specific issue is on um, Britano. So, um, you know, I, I understand this is a, an area where it's at the base of the hill. There's a lot of runoff that comes down these hills when it rains. Um, and sometimes it, um, you know, gets uh, from gutter to gutter um, on the street and causes street flooding. And, um, you know, certainly um, something that's been identified in the storm drain master plan is uh, something that um, should be improved at, at some point. But um, based on the level of funding we have at the moment, it just it has not risen uh, to something that has that uh, we're proposing to elevate to a need uh, this year. But it's it's one of those um, items where as we have further discussions and we have made it through the bulk of our paving project and have a better idea of where our funding uh, may be able to come from, uh, we can certainly you know have some more conversations about which one of these next projects is is going to be undertaken. And I think also once we get through that CCTV evaluation of some of our storm drains, um, you know, and look at the condition of some of these pipes, um, you know, if, if there's an issue with some of these pipes um, in this area, then it would probably elevate them to being done sooner rather than later in whatever storm drain plan we come up with. But, you know, if we have a number of other locations that have also been identified as being deficient and the pipes are also at a point uh, where they're at the end of their useful life, then those projects may um, be elevated above this one. So um, at this point, it's not on our high priority list. We understand it's it's in the list and it's uh, it'll uh, not fall off the list. It'll be part of the conversation as we move through um, working out how to fund our storm drain um, improvement needs. Okay, well, well, thank you for that. Um... I was going to make a comment over the, about the fact that we're not having much rain these days, but uh, that may not be any consolation. Um, any other, uh, uh, anything else from the public? I guess we had nothing else uh, teed up. So I guess we'll bring it back to the council. This isn't an action item. This is just a, a report. It looks um, like a hand has been raised in the air. Oh, wait, I don't see that. For the public. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Allison. Have one comment, uh, caller ending in 1402. Okay, go ahead. Can you identify yourself and where you live, please? Uh, James Holmes, Larksburg. Yeah, for some reason, the first time I tried the Star 9 didn't work. Uh, a couple of questions and, and one comment. <clears throat> Pardon me. The uh, questions uh, are um, uh, question one uh, Would either of the crosswalk improvements or the uh, LED streetlight switch out uh, be funded by Measure B? Uh, the second question, uh, <clears throat> will the uh, measure, uh, I'm sorry, will the uh, street lights, LED street lights, be the bright uh, fluorescent type street lights that have caused problems and concerns uh, in some other communities? And uh, m my comment is, as, as hesitant as I am to, to request any additional funding, it would be wonderful if, if somewhere in the uh, CIP at some point there could be found uh, some money to uh, restore the lettering uh, on uh, City Hall, uh, which um, has been missing since the renovation a few years ago. And uh, my understanding is that lettering fell apart, but uh, the, it is uh, unfortunate not to have uh, this finishing touch on, on the historic building, and it would be very nice to be able to uh, restore it uh, at, uh, at some point. Not with Measure B funds, though. Okay, well, thank you for those uh, comments, James. Um, um, anyone else? There were a couple of questions embedded in that. I, th I think, Julian, yeah. did you wanna respond? Yes, I can. Um, 
so as far as measure B funds go, um, so the, the citywide paving plan fund, um, which is uh, the bond that's being repaid with the measure B funds is the proposed funding source for the crosswalks. Um, the crosswalks are part of the street. Um, it was part of the city's adopted policy to spend measure B funds on the streets and um, other associated improvements with the street. So similar to the ADA ramps that we paid for, with the Measure B or the citywide paving plan, uh, we do propose to uh, pay for the crosswalks with those funds. We consider the crosswalks an integral part of the street and eligible for that funding. Um, the LED streetlight conversion we're proposing to pay for with gas tax. So that's not um, the Measure B funds. Um, and then the City Hall lettering is uh, something that our uh, maintenance crew is aware of, and the letters are actually, um, were not salvageable and need to be recreated. And so that's, that is on a list for replacement, but I uh, would have to um, get back to Mr. Holmes, uh, let him know where that is on our, on our priority list. Uh, but we are aware um, of that issue. I think one of his other questions, Julian, was uh, the nature of the LED lights. It might be a good opportunity to remind folks we already have LED lights in our community in some locations, uh, and we haven't had the same complaints that other communities have had. Right. Um, sorry, I missed that. Um, yeah, so the LED technology has come a long way since um, I think it first started 10 years ago when there were a lot of grants um, out there for mass replacements of, of streetlights. Um, and while they are energy efficient and maintenance friendly, uh, one of the early issues with the LED lights was the color of the light. Uh, in order to be um, energy efficient, the lights needed to be a certain temperature that was um, very white, if not blue in some cases. And so a lot of the early deployments uh, were not very pleasing to people. Um, and there are various studies out there about the, the bluer the light and the closer it is to a daylight, it interrupts people's uh, sleep patterns. Um, and so the LED technology has evolved so much now that uh, the current LEDs are able to be almost the same color as a high pressure sodium and still get the energy um, efficiency. And in fact, um, as streetlights in the city burn out, we don't replace with high pressure sodium anymore. Uh, they're being replaced intermittently with LED. So there are intermittent LED lights all around us that uh, probably haven't been noticed because the newer ones uh, blend in the, the, the same as the, the high pressure sodium. Um, and um, Coromadera is a little bit of a, they're doing the same program. They're a little bit of a, ahead of us and they do actually have some test locations that are up and I can provide that information. And when we come back to the council to approve this project um, later on, we can provide that information if folks wanna go out and, and, and have a look and, and see what the latest technology um, lights look like. And the other advantage of, of these LEDs Right, Julian. I think you had it in your slide. Is that they're more, you're, they're better able to be focused, and not have so much of the light be spread out into um, homes uh, uh, and, and and lawns and other areas. Yeah, one of the reasons they're they're more efficient is because they actually throw less light out overall uh, because they're able to focus the light where it needs to be, and so. Uh, they will typically light up a, a sidewalk and a street as they're supposed to, and there will be much less wash uh, onto neighboring uh, homes. Right. I know that's been an issue for the county with the new light installations that they put in on Sir Francis Drake and some of the spillover of the light into, into uh, homes um, uh, at the margin of Sir Francis Drake. And I think they're, they're working hard to try to address that problem. Um, okay. Uh, anyone else? Anything else in uh, in the queue uh, for the public? Looking for any further raised hands or emailed comments, and there is no public comment. Okay. Well, in that case, I'll I'll bring it to the council. If uh, there are no further comments or questions from the council, um, this is not an action item. We'll look forward to seeing. Uh, the plans uh, finalized, and I guess they'll come back at the same time we do the budget. Yes, it's proposed to come back to you at the same time the operating budget does at the next meeting. 
or not the next meeting, the next regular meeting. Right. Okay, good. Good deal. All right. Well, thanks very much, Julian. Um, it's always helpful to understand where we are on these projects. And that will conclude uh, that item. And we will move on to agenda item 8.3, which is appointment of council members to participate in the city's housing uh, steering uh, committee, which is a focus on wrapping up um, what we need to do on the, on the housing element and having a process for doing that. So can we have a staff report on that matter? Okay, uh, thank you, Mayor Haroff and members of the city council. I'm Neil Toff, planning and building director for the city of Larkspur. And uh, so in completing the preparation of the draft general plan, the city utilized a steering committee made up of two members of the city council and two members of the planning commission. And this committee assisted staff in refining the goals, policies, and programs for that draft document. And also helped us review the final sort of look and feel of some of the diagrams and graphics uh, for that document. Um, staff found this approach was effective for providing feedback and guidance on challenging topics. And the study session and public workshops also served as a good forum for public participation in finalizing that, uh, that policy document. Now, over the last several years, the state has adopted expansive legislation to reduce obstacles to housing development. And this is imposing a number of mandates on the city uh, to uh, update policies and update ordinances to, uh, to meet these um, mandates, reduce these obstacles. And additionally, the city must update its housing element by early uh, 2023, we should have a draft housing element uh, ready to go by the end of 2022 um, in order to address its housing goals under the sixth greenness cycle. Uh, the state has also, uh, along with that, provided a number of funding opportunities for local agencies to better plan for and facilitate housing development. And as such, there are several programs we are currently working on with uh, the county and, so, and others will be soon underway uh, through the assistance of state funding in collaboration with the County of Marin and other agencies uh, throughout the county. And I've summarized some of these in the memo to you uh, to the report tonight, um, the objective design and development standards. We have a, a, a draft toolkit prepared that we can begin to um, utilize to uh, refine and um, fit the local community standards. And that will require some uh, workshops uh, to uh, refine that, uh, those, those standards um, before adoption. Uh, we also have the housing element update, of course, and that's gonna be very challenging. Uh, we know we have some very significant arena numbers as well as the mandates from the state to assure that the housing element doesn't just plan for um, housing units, but also uh, performs, uh, is designed to be able to really assure that those housing units will be built. Um, so that's a very uh, challenging program we'll be looking at. Additionally, uh, we have been working with the county and some other agencies through Marin using state funding to analyze our inclusionary housing policies and in lieu fees. Uh, inclusionary housing is the tool by which uh, cities can require affordable housing in conjunction with multi unit development. And in lieu fees are a way of um, substituting the housing development through in lieu fees uh, to be used for other housing projects. And the study included the opportunity for nexus fees for. Um, market rate housing or commercial development to help support uh, affordable housing. So we're going to be using that study to look at our in current uh, inclusionary housing policies and fees and adjust them to really meet our needs uh, for the upcoming housing element. Uh, other housing related policies and code updates may be needed in the future and it will be helpful to have a committee kind of focused on housing to help uh, provide feedback and direction for staff 
as we formulate um, policy documents and standards uh, for eventual public hearing. So we anticipate that this committee would uh, not require attendance more than one to two meetings a month at most during busy times, um, depending upon the immediate topic at hand. Um, these would mostly be study session format and occasional public workshops where a real interactive feedback with the public is uh, sought. Uh, the Planning Commission will be holding a similar discussion at their meeting next week uh, for appointing two members at, uh, uh, for the committee. So with that, um, we're requesting that the City Council uh, authorize and appoint two members for a housing steering committee. Okay, great. Um, thank, thank you, Neil. Um, and having participated in the steering committee uh, that helped um, um, provide some uh, assistance in putting together the overall general plan, it's a very worthwhile experience. And although two meetings a month sounds like a lot, it's actually not 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 too bad. And certainly wasn't what we had what we experienced necessarily before. So, well, one thing I would like to add to that is we certainly try to design the meeting so we're providing you with very focused homework and uh, a very um, focused presentation, try to identify the, the particular topics that need, we're really looking for feedback on and uh, try to keep it as a, as, as, as a focused meeting. Okay. Any other comments or questions uh, by the uh, council for Neil's presentation before we uh, uh, act on this? Seeing none, uh, anything from the public, Allison? Thank you. I'll note that the council did receive an email public yes. comment prior to the meeting. So it's made available on the online agenda packet. And I'm looking for any further raised hands or emails, public comment. And there are no comments. Okay. Well, in that case, we'll bring it back to the council. And I think we need a, uh, an action to approve the formation of a steering, a steering committee uh, on the housing element. And um, uh, see if we can get uh, uh, one or two of us to volunteer to participate in that. Um, and on, on that, I personally would be happy to do it as I view it as a continuation of the role played uh, in the steering committee for the overall uh, general plan. So uh, I see Gabe's hand is raised. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that I would love to see this committee move forward and uh, would be happy to participate as well. So um, I just thought I'd um, mentioned I, I did the um, the training for the planning commissioners, and I've been really trying to follow the state legislation, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and um, would love to be a part of this. Okay, great. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in? That sounds fine to me. I'm. I'll if nobody else wants to step forward, I'll be an alternate um, because I, I and I think Gabe you would be a a nice fit because of the work you've been doing um, in the last two years with our mobile home community. So, but it's true, this, this is really an extension in many ways of the general plan. And I think it would also be um, a really beneficial thing for as a new council people to um, see how this process goes through. So I will um, put my hat in as an alternate if we need me. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Might need to right. actually. Uh, I'm available for whatever you need, Kevin. It sounded like you and Gabe were, were stepping up, so um, I can be an alternate, whatever makes sense. Well, that I think that that would be good. So, Catherine and, and Scott, um, alternates, and Gabe and myself uh, will be uh, designated members of the committee. And if, unless anybody objects to that, that's what we'll do. I'll move those recommendations, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, I don't know that we need a formal uh, motion, but I'll take it. Uh, do you want to uh, uh, have a second? Sure, second. Then let's go ahead and vote. Council Member Candell? Yes. Council Member Paulson? Yes. Council Member Way? Yes. Vice Mayor Helmer? Yes. Mayor Hara? Yes. 
So there we are. And we'll look forward to hearing from the planning commission. They're going to take it on themselves to designate uh, who they want to uh, represent them on this steering committee next week. Is that right, Neil? That's correct. And uh, from there, again, this isn't one specific process. This is going to be a few different parallel processes yeah. going on, but I'll begin to give you some idea of our work program for each of those. Well, I, like us, we have a, I think we have a, a veteran from the previous steering committee and maybe we can get somebody else added on that's new to the process and on the planning commission. That, that would be I good. Think so. Okay, great. Well, then I think that um, resolves that item. And yeah. then uh, that was 8.3. Uh, we'll move on to 8.4, which is um, the one that I'm interested in personally, uh, display of flags and banners at City Hall. And this is a two-part one. Uh, one is to consider adoption of a draft policy, providing guidance on when and under what circumstances uh, flags and banners may be uh, uh, displayed at City Hall. And then uh, we'll move on to a second matter after we consider the policy um, to uh, have its first possible implementation. So can we have a staff report on the policy? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, council members. Um, the mayor recently reached out to staff. Um, discussions have been occurring in communities all throughout Marin about the display of flags uh, uh, that make comm commemorative or other statements uh, on behalf of the city. And um, staff did some research and found out there uh, is a, a practice that many cities go through to adopt a particular policy to authorize the display of such flags. So we consulted with the city attorney's office to uh, bring to you an appropriate draft policy. Um, we ran into a logistics complication, which is uh, we don't really have a whole lot of flagpoles here in Larkspur that the city owns. In fact, we only have one, which is a pole that's over in Piper Park at the softball field. Um, the pole that people see in front of, uh, that they perceive as being in front of City Hall is actually uh, considered part of the lease to the fire station and the fire department takes care of that pole. Um, but in talking it through uh, with some staff and talking with the mayor a bit, uh, it seemed appropriate to propose a policy for you that would allow us to use our balcony as a potential place to display these types of commemorative flags or statement flags. And so um, that's consistent with us occasionally having banners and other things that we display from the balcony as well. So um, the policy before you provides guidelines on how you could bring forward uh, requests for such flags uh, and uh, how they would how we would go about displaying them. And then uh, if you adopt the policy, then you can take up the second question in the next item, which is uh, the mayor is proposing a proclamation for a specific flag. So first you need to start with the first item, which is the general policy, and then right. we'll move on to the second item, which is the specific uh, interest that the mayor would like to discuss. Right, and that, that's what we'll do. So with that report, I'll open up to the council for any questions. Um, at this point, limited just to the proposed policy and associated resolution. Uh, Scott has his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have some uh, concerns, um, which uh, maybe uh, the city attorney can help us with. Um, my concern is that uh, we are going to be approached by a group, uh, you know, that wants us to fly a flag, whether it's, you know, the rainbow flag in June or uh, I don't know that there's a, uh, a flag for Black History Month in, in February or um, uh, I don't know, a Jewish holiday, uh, you know, Kwanzaa, whatever it happens to be, we're going to be start being approached by lots of different groups. And I am concerned that uh, if we fly one flag and we don't fly another, we are going to have to explain why we have prioritized one group of our constituents over another group of our constituents. And I think that puts us in, in a very difficult situation. Um, so I'm 
I'm hesitant to to step into that arena because um, I, I see that as a, a potential problem moving forward, and I'm I, I just don't see it ending well. So I was wondering. Uh, I don't know if it's really a legal question, you know, of of how we decide that or, or, or a political question, but I just see it as a, a potential problem down the road if we if we start taking this path. Um, well, th thank you for Scott. And maybe I could kick it back to the city manager because I think in teeing up this uh, resolution and policy, um, there, there, some work was done to see what other cities and, and towns may have uh, done uh, on this issue. And I know that there are other communities here in Marin that have adopted uh, policies along these lines. Maybe, maybe Dan, you could give us a little input on what information you have on that. Well, I think there's two elements to Council Member Candell's question. And so I'm going to, to fumble my way through one and Sky can bail me out if I mess it up. Okay. The second part I actually want to comment on first, which is I can't really assure you one way or the other who may or may not come and ask um, a council member to sponsor uh, a request. Um, that's something you have to discuss among yourselves. Um, the first point is that um, there's a, a body of law now that states that uh, cities, if you establish that you're going to take requests and you're going to respond to requests to do something that the courts view as uh, public speech, then you potentially are creating a form for public expression. And so this policy specifically prevents that by saying, um, these are not groups coming and making requests and the city is going to honor those requests. It's a member of the city council asking the council to make a statement or take a position as a city. And so the policy is written so that if there is some flag commemorative display or banner that the council wants to see displayed because you as a council are choosing to make a statement as a council or on behalf of the city, that's what the policy is written to do. Uh, and that's purposeful so that only you five or your successors can actually decide that there will be a statement from the city that involves the display of something. So, so let me let me jump in then because it sounds like then it's more of a, a city council question than a uh, legal or city manager question. And my concern is, uh, yes, this this month it's uh, somebody from LGBTQ uh, comes and says we'd like to to you to display a flag. How are we going to handle it when someone comes to us next month from another group and asks us to display their flag? I, I find we're going to be in a real tough spot if we start choosing which groups we deem worthy of flying their flags and which groups we don't. And, uh, and that, that I, so I agree that's the conversation you as a group of five need to have, which is what are your concerns around this? Because the practical reality is uh, whether it's because you've been talking to a constituent or whether or not it's personal passion, you may bring forward the idea of displaying a particular flag or symbol. And then the five of you will need to wrestle with whether or not to say yes or no. And I can't assure you one way or the other, other than to tell you, we did ask other cities sort of what, what flags do you end up flying? Uh, and what we heard a lot was the pride flag, the, the POW MIA flag, uh, and sister city flags. Those tend to be the most common ones that, that are being flown. Um, but I appreciate the question that Council Member Candell is asking. And I think the secondary discussion of sort of what boundaries you wanna put on this or, or are you prepared for the potential of having to take this up for different issues is something the five of you should discuss. And just for clarification, although I think you made this this point, Dan, the way these requests would go is it wouldn't be a request from some outside group to the council. It would be a sponsorship by an individual council member that may have been prompted by a request by a group or may not have been. Uh, and that's the way it would be presented to the council if, 
correct me it if would I'm be wrong. presented to the council as uh the mayor or a member of the council would like the city to make a statement right. and that the the city council or the city and in doing so as part of that statement the council would like to display a particular commemorative icon which may be a flag or a banner or something right so nature. if but it's city it's the city and or the city council making a statement whether or not you the genesis of your desire comes from a request from a constituent or your own personal beliefs the policy doesn't get into that the policy is you as one of the a member of the council brought this forward and that's how it got on the agenda and that's what I was trying to clarify. It, it would be a request from a council member but, to the council. But I, do, but I do think that doesn't really avoid, or it, it, council member Candell's question is still needs sure. to be discussed by the five of you. No, I, absolutely. Regardless just, of sort of how right. the issue gets there. So. I just I just want to make sure it was clearly understood it's that, that, there, that the policy as proposed envisions a certain pathway for these issues to be teed up for the council to be decided. And I just wanted to make sure there wasn't confusion about that. Um, okay, any other comments? Like Vice Mayor Hilmer, I see he's got his hand raised. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I agree with Scott's uh, comments. I, I think there's uh, a lot to consider before we put ourselves in a position to be picking uh, winners or losers or issues or not issues. I think um, the confusion that would ensue by the perception created by the fine line of, of uh, you know, this being a council decision versus something else. I think there's so much explanation that would have to accompany that every time conversation would take place. That I don't know that we've uh, vetted this for what the actual interest of the council is yet. So I, I, I'm not ready to, to support the policy tonight without um, really examining what this, where this places the council. And I, I'd like more time for us to think about it and talk about it. Thank you. Okay, good, great, thanks. And uh, uh, council member Paulson, you had your hand up. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I just I had three observations. I, I think the first it's somewhat of a question. It seems like the policy is addressing the legal you know side of free speech. So we you know can't have you know public buildings and individual free speech commingled. So it's sort of taken what could be a legal policy and turned it into kind of a political process. So essentially, it's saying that you know whatever happens will be what elected decide. And so we may have um, the rainbow flag this year, but in 2020 council members, we may not. So it doesn't really set the public up for any consistent expectations. You know, it's really just based on what the political process is for the council at any given time. And, and the second observation is I think this, you know, Scott, you know, what, what uh, he's saying, it really seems to run a little bit off the whole Sir Francis Drake renaming you know, where, again, we went for a ceremonial, uh, I, I did at least push for a ceremonial. I really thought it was important to acknowledge the Miwok or whomever, but, you know, there was so much division there. I, I think that the comments coming up, you know, have shown the heart of controversy. And and I, I don't know how that would be revisited here, but, um, you know, I, I think I think it, it is possibly putting a very long and divisive, you know, drawn out debate into many sessions, if there's a, you know, you know something that's that's seen as religious by some and not by others, I don't know if we could really adjudicate that. Um, but I, but I did want to say I, I do kind of support the fact that it's only flown on city hall, and some of the parameters are clear. And if it were up to me, I, I would really endorse that we would have almost you know a, a yes policy to request if it's Black History Month or if it's you know uh, another one. It, it'd be an ability for the public to express themselves as a flag on city hall. And that would be one council member's view of saying, I don't think we'd have to turn down many people. Um, I see Dan waving his hand. I, I want to take tremendous care here because I played devil's advocate in the in analysis of this. It's really important that you follow the city attorney's guidance 
and not create an open forum for public expression by saying you're gonna say yes to every request. Think about a flag of tremendous negative connotation that's been a source of controversy in the South. And if you're not careful creating a policy where you have to say yes to that. I'm using that as an extreme example. I'm not suggesting anyone in our community would come forward to do that, but it's really important this policy has been crafted to protect this situation so that it's the council as a group making a statement that's appropriate for our community. And it's not saying yes to every request. It's the council making its own statements on behalf of the city. And it's really, it's been impressed upon me that that is the legal distinction of this policy and it's critical that your statements align with that if you want to have this policy. Thank you, Dan. And, and actually, since I see Sky smiling in the background, since I think he had uh, some hand in, in um, <laughs> seeing this policy up for us, maybe you could give some comments about uh, how that came to be. Yeah, so um, and I, I, it seems I, I've done my job with Dan, so that's it, which is why I'm smiling. But um, I'll, I'll try to I'm, I'm trying not to introduce what is um, a complex area of law that um, we've attempted to boil down into um, retaining, uh, creating a policy in which um, ultimately, as Dan says, it's the city council deciding what speech it wants to make on city property um, about, about public issues. Um, as long as the city council is the one deciding um, what speech to make, um, you retain the discretion to decide uh, which flags to fly. Um, and I don't know that it, and it, I mean, it, it may only help some with the political issue that I, I agree is one that's not addressed <laughs> policy like this. But, but one of the things that we did in trying to craft this policy is to say, if the idea for a flag generates from the public and not from an individual council member, then they have to approach the council member. And then an individual council member has to decide, you know, I am aligned with this idea and I want to propose it to the rest of the council. And then a majority of the council has to decide this is speech that we want to make um, for the city, that we will, which is a statement that we want to make that represents our community. Um, but, it retain, but it remains the city speech so that the individual council member has the ability to decline to bring it forward and the council as a whole has the ability to say we we don't believe that this is the statement that we want to make on behalf of the whole city without passing judgment on on the statement itself it's just something where the council is deciding we just don't want to make that state we don't want that to be the statement that the city makes um so that might help some but but not completely, I understand, but, but, it's, but it is part of why we've crafted the policy that way, both to address First Amendment issues and also to provide several sort of off ramps throughout the, throughout the whole process before the city council has to make a decision about what speech to make. Um, well, thank you for that, Scott. I actually thought that the solution that this resolution embodies is a pretty clever one. Um, and one that keeps us on the right side of, of both law and, and policy on that. And it's a, it's a, it's, as, far as I understand, it, it's a policy that has been adopted or something close to it has been adopted by uh, other jurisdictions that you may be familiar with. Yeah, it's, this is a very common approach. It's because of the way the US Supreme Court and lower courts have decided First Amendment issues, um, the only way that the city can can retain complete control over something like flagpoles or displays at city hall is to for, for is to make decisions like this where where the city council is deciding to make the make the statement for itself and for the city. Um, but but as long as things are set up that way, the city retains control over it and doesn't doesn't have and and and, and is fairly well protected against claims that it's discriminating against various viewpoints. Um, or, or allowing some speech and not allowing others because ultimately it is the city's speech. But yes, just, it's a pretty common approach that many cities have adopted. Including cities in Marin? Um, I believe so. Is that right, Dan? Am I remembering correctly? Actually, um, I think you're going to be seeing many of the councils discussing this over the next few meetings. So. 
Okay. But it, certainly outside Marin, that it, it's a it's something that people have done. Okay. Anything else from the council on this? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Um, I that clarified it a little bit more for me. Um, but I'm hearing two different terms. I'm hearing flag and I'm hearing banner. And if it's a banner that is attached to the building at City Hall, there's nowhere in this policy that describes. Oh, here's just my interruption tonight. There's nothing in this policy that describes um, uh, what size banner, um, what the banner material is, what um, historic, uh, how we're going to address the um, historic nature of our city hall building and whether this a banner has certain specifications because of those reasons. I, I feel like it's very unclear yet. On here. Well, remember, remember, this would be you telling the staff to display something. So what so if it's then, so what if it's a twelve by twenty foot banner that somebody wants? No, I mean, no, no, no. Let's be clear. It's you telling me, Dan Schwartz, go do a display of a banner. So I, you have to trust that your staff wouldn't put a giant banner in front of City Hall. Yeah. I, I, is sort of my response to that particular. I don't, I mentioned banner because we get from time to time members of the community who want to display something that's uh, not in the shape of a flag, but more in the shape of a banner. But I, I, it would still, we would make sure it was scaled. And we can certainly come back with more guidelines, but we, um, you'd be giving the guidelines to your staff, not to anybody in the public. Yeah. yeah. And I would just I would just add to that to again just think through the just to in light of the process that's outlined in the proposed policy. Um, even if even if a proposal originates with an individual going to a council member, ultimately, just like the proclamation that's in front of you tonight, the city council is going to have to take an action to authorize um, any particular flag or banner to be flown. And that means that on a case by case basis, since it is the city's speech that's being authorized, the council can say, we're approving the flying of this banner, but we don't want it to be any bigger than this. And we want it to be aesthetically consistent with the historic nature of the of city hall because it's going to be because it's going to be displayed on on the on the um, balcony. I get it. So, yeah. so you, you so, and you don't have to worry about treating things differently from case to case, because again, it's the city's speech. So the council can decide on a case by case basis, how the display will be made. Okay. Uh, so council member Candela, your hands up again. Yeah, th thanks. Um, and I'm, I'm a little torn on this because, you know, things like the rainbow flag I, I, I'm in favor of, you know, I, I just, my concern and, and uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I get the, the vibe that you are in favor of this. And I, I just want us to kind of play through the scenario of this slippery slope that is in front of us, where there's something that we may say is not controversial, like the rainbow flag, maybe a Black Lives Matter flag. And then there's something a little bit further down the road, you know, that's, you know, maybe a, we kind of agree with, but it's a little bit more controversial. Maybe it's a you know, uh, the, the Mideast conflict, someone wants to put a uh, peace in the Middle East thing, maybe a pro-Palestinian thing, maybe a pro-Israeli thing. I mean, there's just, there's just so many variations that could put us as a council in a very awkward position of basically voting on community values. And I'm just, I mean, if we if we all choose to go there, so be it. I'll, you know, we'll vote on these values and we'll, we'll choose what flags to fly. But I can just see that becoming, uh, as uh, Vice Mayor said, divisive at, at some point because I don't think you're going to have universal feeling uh, over some of the things that are introduced. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for that, and 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 I appreciate that, and and I don't I don't want to I don't want to prejudge the debate by anything that I may have said in this. Um, um, but I do feel fairly strongly that the policy as proposed, which has been very thoroughly thought out, really um, addresses those concerns as a procedural matter. Um, it takes nothing away from uh, the council's ability to make decisions about whatever it wants to do, regardless of whatever anybody else wants us to do. So any other comments from the council? 
seeing none at this point, maybe we can open it to the public. Allison, any hands raised out there? Our first comment will come from, I apologize, I'm having trouble unmuting our first commenter. Uh, I will move on and come back. Uh, our first comment now will be from James Holmes. Okay, James, go ahead. Hi, uh, James Holmes, Larkspur. Uh, for, for decades, the uh, city has had a very successful policy of limiting uh, city hall flags and banners to uh, city-sponsored events. I see no reason to deviate from that policy and, and good reasons not to, which have been adverted to by a council member, uh, Candell. I don't think the, the, the policy is, as uh, the mayor characterized it as clever, but it certainly won't be, its subtlety will certainly not be perceived by the community. Uh, the community will see the city hall now as either a public forum or else it will be seen as a kind of a discriminatory uh, display case where you have to have connections in order to get something put up. I mean, it's interesting here that this policy envisions that people go to the council or go to an individual council member rather than the uh, staff, which is another deviation from standard procedure. <clears throat> uh, I think it's going to put the council in a lot of uh, and delicate situations. It's going to bring pressure on the council. It's going to lead to a lot of uh, uh, unhappy uh, discussions. And I can see a, a, quite a number of, of cases where people would be uh, uh, wanting banners. I mean, there was a, over 90 minutes at the local su at the supervisors' meeting about uh, vaccinations, uh, 5G. Uh, gun gun issues. Uh, if you do, and and particularly if you put up something, be it gay rights or something else, and somebody uh, puts up a, a contrary or proposes a contrary view, it really will be seen as uh, discriminatory. We also know that people vandalize in this day and age, unfortunately, venues if they don't like uh, the message. And uh, w there actually have been cases where people, where, where uh, uh, communities have been sued because uh, <clears throat> they allowed uh, Black Lives Matter to be posted, but uh, would not uh, allow other types of sentiments to be posted. Uh, so uh, in, in, all in all, I see no good reason to open this particular uh, can of worms and urge the city to stick to its uh, current policy and let uh, uh, those who want to express themselves uh, avail themselves of the very many uh, other opportunities that are available to them. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, anyone else in the queue, Allison, for public comment? Uh, I am attempting to unmute our next commenter, Dana Van Gorder. And I I apologize. I'm getting a message, Dana, that your that your Zoom version is an older version. Let's see. I, okay, I apologize. I'm going to need to promote Dana to a panelist in order for her to be able to provide her comments. Anyone object to that? that? No, go ahead then. There she is. We've moved over to the panelists, and I'm just requesting her to um, turn her camera on. Okay, so we see a face. It appears they have left the meeting. The name's still there. Well, it doesn't look like this is going to work. Um, I don't know, Allison, unless there's something else we can do, I think we need to just let that one go. Yes, Dana Van Gorder, if you'd like to email your comments to uh, cityclerk at cityoflarkspur.org, they can be read for you. Allison, Allison you might mention the the call-in option too, and maybe what the phone number is. Yes. 
you may also call in using the phone number one six six nine nine zero zero nine one two eight and the webinar ID is nine four four zero four zero zero four five nine six. Those are listed at the top of the agenda and you can use star nine to raise your hand. Okay, well, let's let's give that a, um, a few seconds to see if they call in. Otherwise, we'll move on. Something just happened. Now the hand's raised. Hello. Yes. Hi, this is Dana Van Gorder. I'm so sorry. Oh, good. No problem. You're you're on. We can't see you, but we see your hands raised. We can hear your voice. My new Mac is uh, is not cooperating. <laughs> um, thank you for uh, allowing me to address you. My uh, my name is Dana Van Gorder. I'm the executive director of the Spar Center, and we um, initiated this request. Um, we uh, serve both the LGBTQ and HIV communities in uh, Marin County and are located in Corte Madera. Uh, there's a lot to say about this, um, but on this particular issue, I want to uh, address the notion of a slippery slope. Corte Madera had a similar conversation last night and it took a slightly different course and decided to deal with the policy later and approve uh, an action to fly the flag for June, you know, pending uh, those decisions. We asked the Board of Supervisors uh, to fly the flag uh, two years ago, and it has done so for the last two years. The first year it was just over the Civic Center, and last year it was over um, a number of county buildings. To my knowledge, the Board of Supervisors hasn't been asked to uh, fly any other flags. And I would point out to Council Member Kendall that it's 2021 and this is the first time that you've asked, been asked to fly a flag like this. So it doesn't seem as though the demand to do this is particularly great. Um, and I'm sure that you didn't mean to say that it would be you know, a slippery slope if the African-American community or the Jewish community or, or other communities that represent the diversity of Marin County um, asked for a similar display of support. Uh, last year, we engaged in, in a strategic planning process in which um, over 250 people that we surveyed and talked to in focus groups told us that Marin County felt like a place for LGBTQ people that was like, don't ask, don't tell. Um, there was minimal level of support and really uh, kind of a, a similar desire to what I'm hearing from council member um, Candell that we <laughs> just kind of go away because we're creating a problem. And, um, and we uh, sort of resolved ourselves to uh, try to make it clear that key institutions in this county do in fact support our community just as they support the the full diversity of our community whether it's the latinx community or the african-american community um, and it would be very meaningful to our many clients and constituents who live in larkspur to see this kind of a display of support um, uh, when you take on the role of becoming an elected official, you, for better or worse, have the job of taking tough positions. Um, and you have a role of expressing exactly what the values of your city are. Um, and I would encourage you to recognize that supporting the LGBT community um, would be an important endeavor uh, and urge you to move forward. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dana. Um, okay, uh, anyone else from the public, if we can see, Allison, or is that it? There's no further public comment. Okay, all right. Well, then in that case, we'll bring it back to the council. And again, I think the way this has been set up is the is it, uh, a bifurcated process where first 
we have the resolution 2921 before us and um, an opportunity for the council to either move adoption or not of that particular resolution. So is there, are there any other further comments um, from the council before I ask for a motion one way or the other? Seeing none, um, since we have, oh, um, I'm sorry, Council Member Paulson, was your hand up or is that? Yeah, just, uh, just very briefly, you know, the, the point that um, uh, uh, Dana made, do we have the option of simply flying the flag without the policy? I mean, is that something that the city attorney and the city manager have already weighed in on? Again, I think the way we've got it set up, we're considering the policy. I personally would be concerned about taking that approach, but Sky, maybe if you have a thought about that. Um, I think that, um, well, there would be one recital in the proclamation that would need to come out because it refers to an adopted policy, but the proclamation itself does state that the city council is taking action to authorize the flying of the pride flag during June as an expression of the city's viewpoint. Um, with that text there, and, and uh, um, I'm assuming that, that is the concurrence of the council, that that is why you would be authorizing it. I, I think that you would be on um, still legally sound grounds in just, adopt, in just taking this as a, as a one-off action. Um, I think you'd be in a better position with the policy in place if you were going to do it, but I think that it would still be a defensible action that you had not created a, a public forum for um, others to come and make similar requests because it would be clear that the city was doing it to, to um, express its own views. Yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to add uh, one more thing is that, you know, being respectful of uh, the vice mayor's, you know, uh, request for deliberation and I I agree with Scott's, you know, some of what he's saying and, and said that earlier. Um, it seems to me that this friendly amendment or this, you know, friendly modification of process would allow us to actually have an instance of the policy acted upon, you know, as, as a way to see how it goes, you know, for further considerations of the policy. So we could both take action for June in particular, and then revisit, you know, how the experience went, you know, without a formal impl implementation of the policy until after. City manager's got his hand up. I just want to point out, um, you may want to then defer the policy for a considerable amount of time because it would be awkward to debate a policy in June and potentially vote no on that policy while you've allowed a flag to fly. So I would defer that discussion well past it if you want to take that approach. Um, and I'd also just point out your next meeting is June 2nd. You conceivably could take up both questions on June 2nd and only have missed having the flag on display for two days. Council Member Kandel. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't really see a reason to delay this. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty simple question. The question is, do we as a city council want to politicize our flagpole? Do we want to use it to make statements that we agree with or not? And that's that's the simple question, you know. And if we say you know we we want to, and then then we'll cross each bridge as it comes. Everybody who brings a request, will will discuss it, you know. And that's fine if that's our choice. But I think that's that's really what we're deciding today. Do we want to to step into that arena and? you know, have thumbs up and thumbs down for people who bring requests to us, or do we want to stay neutral and say, you know what, you know, our, our city hall flagpole is, is not for that purpose. It's for purpose of flying the American flag and the California flag. And that's, that's the purpose of our flagpole. Yeah. Again, this is not a, just a technicality. We're, we're not asking uh, what's, what's being requested here is not to take down the American flag from the flagpole. It's not the city's flagpole. It's the fire department's flagpole. The, 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 the request is to adopt a policy um, that would allow these decisions to be made in the future on a case-by-case -case basis, consistent with applicable legal requirements. Um, so I think that's the answer to that. Any other, any other uh, uh, comments or questions from the council? I'm ready to make a motion, Seeing, Mr. Mayor. Yes, uh, let, let's, uh, let's have a motion. 
Uh, I'll move the uh, alternative process that was described by allowing the one-off flying of the uh, flag under consideration this evening and defer the discussion of the policy uh, till the appropriate date. And if I could just clarify that, just um, the the proclamation um, would, would need have to be amended. Yeah, so there's a there's a there's one whereas paragraph that refers to the city having adopted a policy which would have to be removed, and in the now therefore be it resolved paragraph, I would suggest that um, so now it says that um, Kevin as the mayor um, approves the display of the rainbow pride flag for the month of June in a manner consistent with the city's outdoor flag display policy. I'd take out that last part and replace it with. Um, display the rainbow pride flag for the month of June um, as an expression of um, uh, as a reflection of the city's views. With those descriptions, I will so move. Can I interpose a question? And I think that I think Dan also would like to comment on this. Yeah, let's take them one at a time. Uh, Dan, is that a process point? I, I think the motion should be you want to defer this policy and tell us to win. Then I think you should take up the second agenda item, which yeah. is whether or not you want to uh, amend the proclamation as right. was summarized. I, that, that sounds I right. I think a motion that combines them isn't, isn't as clean. So. Right. I, I agree with that. So just to be clear on what the process would be if we go that route, we could have an, we could have a motion to adopt. We could have a motion uh, to table the policy to some un, undefined future, for consideration at some defined future date. Um, and that would resolve the issue of the policy. And then we could come back to uh, Vice Mayor Hilmer's motion for adoption um, of a specific proposal with respect to this particular case? No, I, I would actually recommend the vice mayor withdraw his motion, which combined. Yeah, 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 right. Yes, together. no, that, 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 I, I, that's what I was trying to say. I just didn't, it wasn't artful. Uh, could I but, ask the city attorney to, or, and or the city manager to advise on the motion that would I, I do see that Councilmember Candelas, though, has been trying to ask yeah. a question or make a comment. I, I then will be happy to advise you, Vice Mayor. Okay, thank yeah. you. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, I, I just don't understand. It sounds like what we're doing is we're saying that we would like to vote on uh, flying a flag, but we don't want to vote on whether we have the authority to vote on flying the flag. I no. Mean, I mean, the, the, the policy basically says okay, we as a council are going to give ourselves the authority to uh, approve a flag. We're saying we don't want to, we don't want to cross that bridge, but yet we want to vote to fly a flag, which, which in my opinion, doesn't make any sense. Let's just, if we, if we want to vote to fly this flag, then we're inherently saying we want to give ourselves the power to fly flags. Let's just pass the, pass the motion to give us the power to fly flags and then vote on flags. You know, it doesn't make sense to, to pretend we don't have a policy and then vote on a flag as if we had a policy how to vote on flags. So I can only, I, I, I can only I, suggest that you not support the motion at that proper time. I, no, I, 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 I'm sure. So, so what I'm saying is that if, if that's what we want to do, then great. Let's, let's, let's vote to, uh, to have a policy to fly flags. And if we agree we want to fly flags, then we'll take each flag as they come. I, I'm, uh, I, I just think it makes much more logical sense than voting on flying a flag without having a policy on voting on flags. And, and what you've just described, Scott, is what's before us right now, as it is. So we would have a vote on the policy. We'd either approve it or not. If the council decided not to approve the policy, we don't need to go to the flag issue. If, we just, uh, if the council decides to approve the policy, then we can have a motion on the flag, this, this particular banner. And that's, that's the way it's been teed up by the staff report, which I think well, is sensible. I'll, I'll play parliamentarian now, Mr. Mayor. You have a yeah. motion on the floor. Yeah, yeah. And the maker of the motions asked for advice because the parliamentarian in this, in the, whether that's me or Sky, uh, has suggested that the motion be modified. But I do believe the vice mayor has the floor for a motion. So yep. I don't actually think 
the way you framed it is, is entirely correct. Um, right now, the motion is to defer a decision on policy and amend the item that's before you as the second part of this, which is the proclamation. My advice to the vice mayor would be to modify his motion to defer the policy to some future date. And then we can take up the question of this proclamation independently of that. Right. I think by combining the two, you're not allowing anyone on the council who may have one feeling about the policy and a different feeling about the proclamation. And I, I, just as a procedural matter, I would suggest keeping them separate. So my advice to the vice mayor would be whether he should he would consider focusing his motion on deferring decision on this policy. Uh, thank you for that clarification. That's what I was trying to say, but I, I, again, wasn't wasn't artful about it. So back to you, Vice Mayor Helmer. Uh, I would move that we defer the consideration of this policy until we have time to, to further uh, get information from staff based on the comments and questions this evening. Okay. Is that your motion? Yes. Okay. Does that Second. sound sufficient? Uh, for now, so we have a second, uh, Council Member Paulson. Uh, then I guess we need a roll call on that motion. Council Member Candell. Sure. Council, mem Council Member Paulson. Yes. Council Member Way. Yes. Vice Mayor Hilmer. Yes. Mayor Hara. No. So I guess the ayes have it and the motion is approved. So then I think we can come back to the consideration now that we've tabled the policy, what will we do about um, the request with respect to this particular matter? And I think Vice Mayor Helmer, you were prepared to make a motion on that. Uh, if it's consistent with the, an amended uh, proclamation, uh, I would ask advice on the um, amendment to the proclamation that would allow the uh, one, quote one off uh, as described earlier. Um, I think it would be sufficient to, to, if you wanted to proceed in this direction to, to move approval of the proclamation with the modifications that I had previously described. Scott, the only one I'm not sure if I heard you say I think the last whereas should say the month of June 2021, because but my understanding is the intent is specifically about 2021. I, I would agree. I would agree with that. Yeah, so, that's right. so with the combined modifications that I had previously described and that the city manager just described. Okay. Dan Helmer, is that? With those uh, clarifications, I will so move. Okay. Can I have a second on that? Councilmember Paulson. And I think we'll take a roll call. Uh, it looks like you do have a request for public comment. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't see those. So, Allison. It looks like Allison may have had some connection challenges. Let me, uh, I think I can actually do this. Okay. Uh, Mr. Holmes, I think you can speak now. Uh, J James Holmes, Larkspur. Um, uh, apropos the concept of uh, uh, slippery slopes, I uh, learned reading the Chronicle this Monday that there is a different uh, uh, flag for the um, uh, leather uh, contingent um, of gays, and it's a uh, it has a, a black and blue uh, stripes. I'm I'm not kidding. So my guess, my question is, if one uh, flies the uh, rainbow flag, would one also be willing to uh, fly the uh, leather pride flag, as it's it's called? <clears throat> but uh, beyond that, uh, I am I am concerned. I I do not think the rainbow flag is merely a, a civil rights uh, a measure. I think uh, it is also um, a a provocative and, and confrontational. Uh, banner which is associated with uh, exhibitionism and and public uh, sexual contact, conduct. Um, at the outset, the um, 
It has a rather unsavory provenance, uh, according to a 1993 um, interview with the designer of the flag in a, um, a homosexual magazine called The Sentinel. Uh, the designer described how the idea came to him in an acid trip. Uh, uh, continuing on that vein, uh, it, as I say, uh, it's not just a civil rights uh, issue. Um, this flag is displayed uh, every year in San Francisco and elsewhere in connection with um, <clears throat> extreme sexual exhibitionism and bizarre ac actions. I mean, I could describe them in detail. Dykes on bikes, uh, hunky Jesus, leather fetishists, uh, Nambla, drag queens, and so on. James, uh, I think the, we get. The, yeah, James, well, I think we get the, your point. If you yeah, want to wrap yeah, that right. up, the, please. The, the sort of thing I, I will wrap up. This it's the sort of thing that uh, might be offensive to people, uh, even if they generally supported uh, gay civil rights. And it is the kind of thing that <clears throat> folks uh, come to places like Larkspur to come away from. So I, I would urge you not to uh, post this particular flag. It has been posted elsewhere in Larkspur, across the street, at, at a private restaurant, and, and it can be elsewhere. But I believe the city hall uh, should be reserved for uh, city activities. Thank you, Thank James. You. We appreciate that. Uh, um, and just one this, clarification, Mr. Mayor, although... Mr. Mayor, I would, just, I would like to just, express just, an just, objection. Just, I want to express an objection to the words I just heard from the member of the public. For okay, the please... Please go ahead. Uh, I just want to state for the record that I object to the words he used. Period. Okay. Um, I, and I take it you mean the, the, the pretty much the entire statement. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I thought. Um, just uh, one point of clarification, which actually James' comment does raise there are various uh, uh, there, there are variations of the flag there's kind of the traditional four bar um, um, flag that I think most people are familiar with there are other iterations that um, are designed to be more inclusive of, of a broader range of different groups and I couldn't purport to tell you all those different iterations but I'm, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Helmer, but I'm guessing that your proposal is to, um, with the qualifications that have been uh, discussed tonight, to fly the traditional flag, four bar flag. Uh, my motion is to approve the uh, resolution or proclamation as amended. And I think the words speak for themselves. Okay, that's Mr. Mayor, I don't think yes. the staff. I don't think the staff is confused about what the rainbow flag is and which one to fly. Okay, all right. Well, I, I was confused, so <laughs> um, uh, that's good enough for me. Okay, so I think we have a sufficiently clear motion uh, as amended, um, and I, do we have a second? I just ask, I mean, I'm looking at the proclamation now. Could you just reiterate what you're amending? Because there's a lot of things in here that say we've adopted a policy, which we have not. So are you ask, I'm asking me, Catherine, the, no, I think the I amended am, motion? I'm, yeah. Well, well, they can help me, but the amended motion removes the references to an adopted policy. So what I had suggested is the removal of the whereas paragraph um, that refers to the city having adopted a policy. Okay. Uh, also, uh, Dan's uh, recommendation was in the subsequent whereas paragraph to state that it would be for the month of June 2021 to clarify that this is a one off. And then in the now therefore be it resolved paragraph, um, I had suggested uh, modifying the end of that so that it would state display of the rainbow pride flag for the month of June 2021. Um, uh, as a reflection of the city's views. So, I mean, listening to all this, I would just request that maybe this can come on the June 2nd uh, agenda with this cleaned up proclamation, because it's I, it feels very unclean, I'm not unclean, but very um, convoluted right now since we did uh, not agree to... Sky is, we're still in a, we haven't published the special meeting agenda. We just put the proclamation on the consent with the modifications. So it's on Monday. 
Yeah, absolutely. We could do would that. Would you be comfortable with that, Council Member Way? We, we yeah, I would, because there's just a lot of things that need to be removed and tightened up in this existing one since we did not vote in the policy in, in under A. And we still have some time to make sure that it's a clean policy. Because I, I, I do hear Mr. Holmes' comments that and Council Member Candell's comments, and I think we need to be very thorough with what we're putting forward and now it seems very inconsistent to me so if if everybody is uh understands what i'm thinking we have time to tighten up the, the language on this but again this would be for monday's meeting um, i guess the only question is whether you want it on the consent or you want it on the open, on the business items but uh we can do it on june 2nd too i was just pointing out you do have a meeting between now and june 2nd so. Well, my my well, my preference would probably be June second because I still think this is a public. You can hear from the comments, and you can hear from our own comments. This is a very, um, very. We're still really fleshing out what this means to all of us, philosophically and policy wise. Um, maybe having it on a Monday when most people aren't um, paying attention to our regular schedule, because I, I can think you can hear it within our own discussion that we're still a little unclear as to how we want to go forward. So, okay. my so we'll do it on June 2nd and we'll bring uh, a modified proclamation then. Okay. So no motion tonight, correct? Um, I can take his direction to bring it back on June 2nd, unless there's objection from the council to that direction. I think that's the, the direction that Council is providing uh, any objection to that? No. No objection. Okay. Thank you for taking that into consideration. Okay, are we all clear? This is coming back on June 2nd with the motion um, and language um, that will clarify what the motion is requesting on June 2nd. Fair enough? Okay, then in that case, I don't think we need any action tonight at all. Any anything further from any members of the council? Seeing none, I think that will conclude that item for now. And with that, we will go to 8.5, which is an update on city activities and finances with regard to COVID. Dan, do you well, have an update? I'll be very quick, Mr. Mayor. I, I covered already that the uh, American Relief Act, we're no longer clear if we're going to receive any funds. So um, we'll just sit and wait to see if we are going to receive any funds. And if we do, we'll come forward with some proposals on ideas of what to do with those monies. Um, the other thing I just want to make council aware is uh, we're watching closely uh, the bulletins and briefings that we're getting about what may or may not happen on June 15, um, because uh, we are still the local enforcement agency for many of the public health orders and we're waiting to get clarity um, so that we know what it is we're supposed to be doing. But all signals at this point are we're shifting entirely to a model of personal responsibility uh, with a lot less regulation. So if that proves to be what comes to pass, um, you know, from a resource standpoint, that's nice for the city. We'll be able to shift some resources into other areas. So uh, I think that's sufficient for tonight. It's pretty late, Mr. Mayor, and we've yep. covered a lot of ground. I think that's right. And I'll look forward to our discussion on, on Monday um, regarding um, aspects of that that we can, uh, we can move forward on. Um, so I think that brings us to the conclusion of the substantive agenda. Item number nine is adjourn. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Moved. Second? Second. And seeing no objection, uh, the motion passes and we are adjourned. Have a good night, everybody. Good night.